All right, all right. Let's take a look. I think we're good. Welcome back. Uh, and welcome to the Build Brewery. Uh, the Build Lab. Mm, very slightly rebranded. Uh, just better structured. And I'm using this as a way to demarcate that. Uh, if you're just looking for a build, you can find a summary at the end of this stream. Uh, that will be whatever we come up with and decide upon during this stream after we discuss. And there may be a name for this little build we've come up with, and that would be in the title, but you can see kind of the version of that we've settled on. At the end of the stream, you can go to the last chapter of this video in the description if you want that. This stream, this series, is really more about the process, you know, dis discussing options for those things. Uh, it's usually pretty obvious for a lot of archetypes and a lot of games what would be a reasonable team for those things. And certainly if you just want a build to copy, I would hope you just wouldn't even bother clicking on like a two hour long stream uh, archive or what, tuning into the stream. Now we're here to talk about different options. I want to hear what other people like. I want to have more fun with this team myself. And I hope that you'll have more fun with it too. I hope you find ideas from this stream. If that sounds cool, you're in the right place. Welcome aboard. So today, a uh, a build brewery, a, a brew. This time I want to brew up. Uh, it's 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 a new name for the series. I'll I'll get used to it. Um, a, a blade lineage team, a partial blade lineage team. We uh, recently got blade lineage mentor Mersault, a a kind of team leader type unit. Uh, now it's sort of beside the point, and we we talked a bit last week about how he's just very strong on the face. Uh, he could have nothing to do with buffing other allies, and this is just a very strong character. Uh, but he does buff other allies a lot. And an interesting thing about the Blade Lineage group is that if you have six of them, in most cases if your entire team is them, the buffs get stronger. But if you were to remove some of the Blade Lineage units, well, your unit quality would go up. You know, you could, you could take all six, or you could remove the worst three, let's say, and while you would get less buffs, they would be buffing stronger units. You know, you could fill those three slots with better units, and you'd be getting less buffs, but you would need them less, because the units they were being given to would be very strong. Having played the full six Blade Lineage team that's available at the time of this recording, uh, yeah, I mean, it's good and all. Uh, and I do think that a lot of people commenting on the weakness level of, like, Blade Lineage Sinclair and Udis maybe don't have them up tied to 4 and leveled to 40, like upgraded all the way, but they're still way worse than the other four, you know? <laughs> I'm not trying to say they're like secretly really good, they're not. Um, and so you could you could go this way, you know, I think they did this because some players just want to put all the things with the label on them in one pile. Again, if you don't want to make a build, hopefully you don't feel like you have to watch a two hour stream to like just match all the same name things together, right? Uh, but we're gonna not do that today. We're gonna, you know, take some of them, but not all of them, and fill the other slots with something, hmm, I, more interesting, I guess. Uh, so we'll, we'll get started. That's, that's it. Pretty straightforward. Um, but there are a lot of options. I mean, it's a poised team. There's a little bit of bleed from Faust's Red Plum Blossom debuff. Uh, crits will give you bleeds, and this counts as a bleed. So it can have that nice thing where you have like a bit of a few different status effects. So if you get like different gifts in mirror dungeons or different buffs or whatever, uh, you know, they may affect the team positively. If you get like a bleed ego gift or item, uh, it may be really good on this team, even though it's not a heavily bleed focused team. Uh, anyway, I, I do want to talk about that, though there are a few units that I think are, are like fairly obvious, like a lot of people will already be thinking, you gotta add, you know, X, Y, and Z. So we'll, we'll talk about those first. Welcome back, asymptomatic, vroom vroom, uh, broom broom, in fact, updated to modern sensibilities, very nice, Ace, welcome back. And Astral Blackjack, welcome back, good timing. How you doing today, folks? Ace, you said, I missed the chance to express it last time. Chains of Others Mersault normally applies offense power down to Mersault. So Bamboo Hatted Mersault specifically gently corrects for that. Mostly trivia in this area of Mersault not having other Zayn Ego to compare to. Most players will just run into it by default. Uh, but that's still really cool, yes. So he, his skill 3, wants you to lose the Clash to get the really powerful to claim their bones version. And Chains of Others and Regret can to some extent make him more likely to lose the Clashes. Yep, um, that is very strong. Uh, fact aside that this team is already virtually guaranteed to fuel this very, very easily. Uh, regret especially. 
This is like the ultimate regret in our assault team. Uh, pride and Wrath. Wow, I wonder where we're going to get Pride and Wrath resources, you know? Um, but there might be something to be said, since that is a powerful aspect of this team. Uh, there is something to be said for the envy cost for Chains of Others. This team doesn't, to my memory, generate uh, terribly much envy resources. Uh, let's say that we cut Sinclair and Udis. They didn't generate any envy anyway. We have uh, only a little. We have Dawn skill 2. And this is a good skill 2. You know, I'll use this most of the time it's up. And we have Yasang skill 3. Also very good. I will use this whenever it's active. So that's something. Um, these units are very linear. You know, one of the things about Dawn and Yasang is they're very... Uh, they just stack poise and do good damage. So they're, if this skill comes up... You'll get a little bit more Envy than you normally would from just one skill 3 that's Envy, uh, because there is no real reason why you wouldn't use this, basically, whenever it's available, you know? It's not like it has some situational combo-based payoff. It's pretty much just a better version of his skill 1. <laughs> uh, and so I, I will use this, basically, no matter how often it comes up. Dawn, it's mostly still true. Uh, she has this thing where her skill 2 and 3 will shotgun poise onto allies, put out a bunch of poise to the team when she crits, but I mean the entire point of running her with Marisalt is that she gets a lot of poise, so she will crit reliably. So there shouldn't be too much reason to hesitate to use this. At the same time, especially if we keep Faust on the team, there are uh, a lot of good uses for envy resources. You know, this costs, a, you know, not much resources total, but two envy, uh, and so it w might be nice. If we had more Envy, um, wow, if only there was a, uh, a relevant unit for poise teams that, uh, that generated a lot of Envy resources. <laughs> uh, golly, that sure would, that would be, that'd be something, wouldn't it? Um, asymptomatic, I think that is, uh, a, a very good thing worth focusing on, though we will probably enable it without trying. And as you said, because there are no other Mersault Ego at this tier, it's not like you can pick something else at the moment. Um... It also has other benefits. You said uh, Blade of the Homeland, um, his passive, uh, will apply to other Blade Lineage allies in ascending order of speed, slowest to fastest. Um, this will this affects Mersault's speed, so it will potentially modify who is getting those buffs. Um, that's also relevant. Um, I think it's like fine, you know, not particularly here or there that he'll get it more often. Because of the way that the, the Blade of the Homeland, the Sword of the Homeland thing applies, uh, it's highest absolute resonance, other Blade Lineage allies. So because we've reduced the amount of Blade Lineage allies on the team, it's very often going to be like just all of them. Like they'll just all get it. Uh, if you have four, uh, chained four pride probably skills, uh, the, all, the whole team of Blade Lineage allies will have the buff. So I think a lot of the time doing a reduced Blade Lineage team will mean that this doesn't matter. Like the order of speeds doesn't really matter. Uh, you will apply sort of the homeland to all four if you run four. Uh, certainly if you run three Blade Lineage allies. But uh, I still think that's relevant to discuss. Curry Rice, welcome back. Curry Race, you said, and Mersault's counter. The opportunity cost to use his counter over skill 1, skill 2, and a blade lineage team is kind of wild. Um, yeah, so you're, you're pointing out there is more envy generation uh, in this theme currently, and it's Mersault's normal counter, not the modified version that he gets when you uh, fail with the skill 3 and get to claim their bones, but his normal counter. Um, yeah, I think the the uh, you, you put it well already. Uh, this is uh, not very good most of the time, pretty bad, because the opportunity cost of not using his skill 1 or 2 and thereby giving the team a lot of poise with his sword play of the homeland passive is very high. But in situations where his skill 3 would have been bad, I, I don't think it's so bad if you use the counter instead. My opinion is that this skill, if you win the clash, is very weak. Um, it has not performed very well for me. It's funny, you would, it, it doesn't look like it would be all that bad. It has like some crit boost stuff, but it's only one hit and the value will be low. Um, I think when this is the skill you're replacing, his counter is like fine. Um, slash power up next turn, that's good. That's good. Uh, this is an interesting clause. This could increase the damage by a lot, um, potentially. So that's an interesting note. Um, he does have a an envy counter, but I think this is usually quite bad to use. Uh, you'd want to try pretty hard to avoid using it, but I mean, it's not bad to have the option. Uh, I, I think that's relevant. I think I'm glad you got me to mention that. That's that's worthwhile. 
Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I think starting to look at other poise options is a good place to start. There is some discussion as well. Let's, let's get uh, some structured discussion points going, shall we? The idea that uh, there is some something to be said for the idea that you you might not want to run four blade lineage units like who are we running and i think some people might want to say what if we run five i think almost everybody wants to cut udis uh although i would be if you don't i would be interested to hear about that and she does generate lust which i think is kind of relevant for this theme uh her egos are fine they're kind of whatever for this theme but this is this is a lust fragility skill that's not good on this theme but it's easy to fuel maybe uh, yeah, she generates Lust resources, uh, her skill 3 is fine, but otherwise this is just one of the game's weaker IDs generally. Um, there's not many identities weaker than this. Um, so I think a lot of people are willing to cut Udis, and then Sinclair, I think the argument is that his, his skill 1 and 2 are just so weak that it feels worth cutting. But on this theme, I think his egos are very, very strong, especially because he can add so much gluttony to the team. Impending Day, with its passive that gives you a lot of resources of the color of the skill you kill enemies with, and then the fact that this ID has a gluttony skill, I think this can be very powerful if you decide to play around that, uh, and you get a, a rather nice heal out of the equation. But indeed, these are uh, really, really bad uh, when they're not getting buffed by Bear Salt. Uh, you could be running a lot of other good units in this slot, right? Um, his skill 3 is absolutely disgusting on a team that will fuel his poise. Uh, this does ludicrous clashing, but the damage is also just absurd on this theme. Uh, this regularly cracks for 150 damage, uh, casual 150 damage, but it's one of his six skills. Like, it's only to be taken so seriously. Um, I, I've used Blade Lineage Sinclair a lot, before Mersault and after, just a lot. I love Sinclair. I love his egos, mostly. Uh, and so I've used this ID quite a bit, because I think it has advantageous uh, sin affinities for Impending Day and Branch of Knowledge. And I agree, having used this ID probably more than most people have, that it's, like, he's really bad. Um, <laughs> it's very, very bad. Um, this, this skill clashes for 12, if every coin rolls heads, uh, which they, you know, there's three, so there's a decent chance that one of them won't roll heads and you will roll a ten. Uh, ten, folks, on your skill two. Uh, that's, it's bad. A uh, nine. A nine on your skill one. If you if they both roll heads, you get a nine. Uh, it's it's bad. I mean, that's that's really bad. Um, the, the sin affinities are very good. Uh, to some extent, I mean, you can fuel his ego really easily in theory, and so you could just use his ego when you need to clash, but like, I sometimes think it's very funny when people say like, you can just use ego when you would want, you know, to when you need to win a clash. It's like, dude, 90 per that's this game, like 90% of the time you, you need to win a, like there is no, oh, well, when you do need to win a clash, you can use an ego for better clashing power, like you nearly always need to win clashes, like <laughs> the content is either trivial or you need to win clashes, so the idea that like sometimes when you need to win a clash, you can replace it with an ego is, that's not a thing, like you, <laughs> you will need to win clashes more often than you will want to spend ego on them, that is my two cents. Um, however, again, the ego quality is pretty good, like really, really good. Um, if you generate a lot of gluttony by using Impending Day's passive and killing with his skill 1, but you can do that in Focus Encounters. Uh, Branch of Knowledge is good clashing, uh, this can be a fine ego, and Lantern is a great heal. Uh, the one Lust is a little annoying, but the team has pride out the wazoo, and if basically only Sinclair is using gluttony, then that's not so bad. Um, so, eh, in theory, I think this is not too bad. Uh, you you would need Lust. Again, that's where the, the Udis generating Lust thing is like, hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy cutting Sinclair. Personally, for me, the real question is, am I running Faust or not? For me, that's really the only thing I'm, I'm trying to decide. But I would be curious if somebody wanted to argue in favor of Sinclair. I could see it. Um, I, and that's the entire point of doing this. Uh, Asymptomatic, you said, Whirlwind thoughts on Fey Lantern Sinclair? I hesitated to thread spin it to 4 for a while, since the coinage remains the same. The attack weight goes up, for better or not better. Letting the corroded Fey Lantern go off can go, hmm, badly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, well, 
uh, Sinclair and his weird sanity situation, right? Um, this can be pretty powerful if he wants the healing to have it be corroded, but um, but yeah, the um, the increased attack weight if he has uh, the HP threshold met is interesting. Uh, I, I don't know, I don't think that's hugely impactful. Uh, the healing doesn't increase by that much, and he only heals two targets with the normal version. Uh, so I personally think this is a, a good up to three breakpoint. Uh, the upgrade to four just doesn't give you as much as a lot of egos go from like one target to three, which is huge. Whereas this goes from probably always three to uh, still probably always three, but maybe five instead of four. I don't know. I don't think that's that good. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's it's only okay. Like we, we wouldn't want to go too crazy on these egos, but impending day is good as always. You get the flexibility. Uh, I like this so much. I did a whole video on it. So I don't know. I I reckon it's all right, but uh, I I can see people cutting Sinclair. Um, you asymptomatic. You said you've been using the Threadspin four version, and often when he is at low health and low sanity and corrodes, and you get exploded. Uh, it's been a problem. Interesting. That that makes sense to me. Uh, there, the, and that's the classic Sinclair experience to some degree, right? Um, I can especially see if you were using um, right attack weight five for for your team. Each center has attack weight of one, so you're going to hit the entire team besides himself, right? I, I suppose. I mean, hitting everyone besides himself and one other person still sounds pretty bad. But <laughs> anyway, um, Sinclair, I would I would lean on the side of no, don't include him. But uh, that's just that's just me. Uh, anyway, catching back up on chat a little more before we go through individual uh, people to include. And I think the next one I want to talk about is Faust, though it might be worth briefly skimming Dawn and and Yisong just to establish why I think I'm like I'm not really considering cutting them. Uh, you might be. That's fine um i think there are very good reasons not to but um mr fruit welcome back how you doing um we just got to the meat of it uh basically we're trying to buff blade lineage identities um Mersalt offers a variety of buffs if you have three pride skills in a chain you're going to give them a lot of poise his skill one and skill two apply well they'll generate that poise and also they buff other blade lineage units skill one and skill two uh, it's like he's an instructor, so if he does his skill 1 that turn, then other blade lineage units' skill 1s are also stronger. But he has this clause you can see. If there are 6 or more allied blade lineage units, you apply 2, and his passive has the same thing. You apply double the benefit if your whole team, basically, is blade lineage. We tried a full blade lineage team last week, fairly obvious thing to do, but most people have settled on this idea, and I, I agree that it's also just more interesting to cut some amount of them. After all, they don't need as much support if they're stronger identities to begin with, so cutting a weaker few of them, and then you get to run stronger identities overall, and the stronger of the remaining Blade Lineage units still get a lot of support, just less, and they need less because they're much stronger, uh, is an interesting trade-off. And obviously there's just much more to discuss. You know, if you're running all the Blade Lineage units, then there's the team, baby. You know, that's not bad, but... Uh, there's just not as much to discuss. Much more interested in discussing, well, we're bringing Mersal, we're making a team around Poise and Mersal. Uh, what other Blade Lineage units, and then who else? Uh, so that's the that's what we're getting into. Um, I, I think I will briefly overview Dawn and Yisong next, and then I'll catch back up on chat, and we can start talking about like who else to add slash Faust question mark. Uh, Dawn, it's fairly straightforward. Um, I think the Envy is relevant for Mersalt's Chains of Others ego. Uh, her skill 2 and 3 will spread some poise onto other units, and if they're from the Blade Lineage, then you get more poise, quite a bit more. Dawn doesn't have the clause where she wants you to have a whole team of Blade Lineage units, so you will likely get more poise if half or more of the team is Blade Lineage units. It is noteworthy for our discussions later that she gives the two allies with no poise or the least poise, poise count. Now will those be your blade lineage units? Won't they have the most poise? So that's something to think about. Uh, this may, while it's better if it hits a blade lineage ally, it may end up being weaker in a team that's partly blade lineage because your non-blade lineage allies will have less poise. 
but not the end of the world. Um, and I, I have found this idea to do like respectable damage. Pride skill one makes it easier to activate mere assaults, powerful, passive, and give everybody poise. I think having envy skill is relevant. The sloth isn't unwelcome, though it's only one of her skills. And Yasang, uh, again, envy. Uh, he has a uh, pretty bad clashing on the surface, but at uptie 4, Blade Lineage Yisang gets this passive where his coin power increases for every poise count he gets. The more poise support he has, the more that's going to be online, but he also just like his poise output himself is much stronger. Uh, this makes his skills clash pretty crazy. Uh, if you take it into account, so we'll assume all his skills have coin power plus 3. You go back and look at them and they're disgusting. Um, this is a 16. 16 clashing skill one this is a 17 and this is some insanity like uh 23 uh it's gross uh the they just have monstrous clashing power and this does preposterous damage um very very strong uh this is a crazy passive but he doesn't get it till up to four it's a little expensive um i think that his poise generation is also noteworthy uh he has this a uh, very nice balance of generating a lot of poise himself, and then when he wins clashes, which is easy for him to do once he gets going, he gets poise count. Um, he ends up being very self-sufficient, even outside of the fact that he doesn't need to be self-sufficient because he's being given support by Marisol. Uh, this identity is just incredible raw power. Uh, you could argue that's kind of a dime a dozen, but I legitimately think this with poise is one of the strongest identities in the game. Uh, he's so difficult to lose clashes with, and he does so much damage, and it's very foolproof. Like, provided he's not just stunned for four turns or whatever and can't build up any poise, uh, it just works. Uh, very powerful. And then it's, I think, Faust, where it gets more iffy, right? Uh, she has uh, relevant sins. You get Gloom on the team, which I think is welcome. There's a few relevant uh, Chains of Others, Marisalt wants Gloom. Uh, the Egos are good, but this theme doesn't fuel them that well. Fluid Sack doesn't really have Lust input yet on this theme. We don't have Gluttony yet on this theme. And Hexnail, we do have Envy, but it's a lot of Envy. Um, so her Ego quality is really bad, I think, for this theme. Uh, but the Plum Blossom effect is a lot of extra crit. Do you really need that? You get a lot of bleed. It gives you crit damage. It increases the damage of your crits. So I'm inclined to say yes. Uh, I think this is still a good fit for the team, but I do think that she is, it's its up for debate in a way that I'm not as, I don't think there's as much of an argument for these three. Um, they're, this is like just boosting the other's damage and her own performance is only okay in my experience. Um... Curry Rice, you said, uh, Dawn's Claw some sounds like something you can circumvent by running non-BL poise units. Yeah, so just to clarify what I was saying before, but the concern is that, it, let's say you run a whole team of poise units. It would be good if the other poise units that were not blade lineage units generated more poise so that the blade lineage units are getting the buff. But you can see how this team just supports the blade lineage units poise more. Like, they probably won't be able to get ahead. These units have good poise generation already. Just on their own, they have good poise generation. Among the best poise generation in the game, before getting supported by Mersault and and Dawn's passives. So it's pretty unlikely that if you run like Twin Hook Pirates Gregor, for example, uh, a very nice poise unit, but he's probably not going to be able to catch up to the amount of poise that they have. Meaning this passive is likely to always hit a non-blade lineage unit. If one of them falls behind. Blade Lineage unit falls behind, like, great, good, you know, they'll get a ton of poise. Uh, but I don't think that that will happen very much, that is my prediction. I think I think this is not to be taken too seriously, uh, and is is one of the trade-offs for not running a full Blade Lineage team. Obviously, if the whole team is Blade Lineage units, then it, it's irrelevant who has the least poise, there'll always be a Blade Lineage target. Um, anyway. For what it's worth, I also think Blade Arc is not that strong. Uh, this gives poise potency. Uh, this gives poise count, and so this is a bit stronger. Uh, you give a blade lineage ally four poise count. Two allies get four poise count if they're from blade lineage. Uh, that's messed up. Like that's really that's incredibly good. Uh, but it probably won't hit you know two blade lineage targets. Uh, still very good. I still think that's very good. Um, and her um, 
the clashing values on these skills are also like perfectly fine. You know, all the, the, she's like fine anyway. Uh, that helps a lot. But uh, but I do think I it's worth expecting that she's not going to give you that much poise. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, Solazaku, you have a proposed team. Blade Lineage, Mersault, Faust, Yisong, Captain Ishmael, Pequot Heathcliff, and Sank Sinclair. Interesting, I thought Sank Sinclair might come up. Um, okay, so let's, um, let's go to the lab. And what I want to do for this step is just put, like, all of the nice poise units onto the bus and look at them and see if anything sticks out. Does that make sense? As a kind of process <laughs> to do. <laughs> um... So, Sang Sinclair, yep, um, I can definitely see that. He does some nice things for this theme. He adds Lust Generation, he adds Gluttony Generation. We get his great egos, all the benefits of the previous discussion. He has a skill too that is Pride, so you can easily activate Marisalt's passive. Uh, he generates a lot of Poise Count. He actually might get ahead of the Blade Lineage units in Poise Count. Uh, very, very good. And of course, he just does insane damage, like this unit is nuts. Um, this is a very raw power gain focused unit uh, you certainly get a payoff for running him uh, and his ego quality has gone from being like a little bit questionable to kind of ridiculous uh, the only thing that his egos are asking for that he doesn't generate is pride and wrath which this team generates a ton of more than you would ever use um, so you will absolutely not like this team became perfect for his ego usage instead of questionable uh, very, very good fit overall, yes. Um, this is great. I actually hadn't seen anyone, I had briefly been considering it myself, but I haven't seen anyone recommend this except for you so far, so that, that was exciting to me. Um, Pequod Ishmael is, like, kind of obvious. Uh, this unit is just extremely powerful raw power. Her skill 2 is Pride, so Marisalt's passive. She's even got a Pride Guard if you need it. Uh, provided that you add Envy, which she adds to the team, you're going to be able to use Blind Obsession a lot, and this is insane. It hits so many targets, it gives them poise, uh, it gives them a uh, sanity heal. You add a sanity heal to the team. Uh, this is crazy. Uh, very, very strong. She supports the team's egos very nicely. She supports her own. We want a little bit more Gloom, but well, we'll get back to that later. Uh, crazy, of course. Now, there is the minor issue that she doesn't herself have uh, much poise except from her skill 3 sometimes. Um, she, you know, when she kills people, she can, she can get uh, poise. But a lot of the time, she's not going to have any poise. Meaning, with Dawn's passive, that's almost always going to target Ishmael. That's kind of good in a way. It means that she'll get poise consistently, but also kind of bad in a way, in that that's someone that is definitely not getting hit from Blade Lineage. Um, I also think Heathcliff, Harpooner Heathcliff, has come up a lot for me. Um, this was one of the first ones I got excited about. Uh, he's got the pride. He's got a lot of envy, so he helps fix that problem a lot. Uh, you've even got the Wrath if you need it. Uh, he has this interesting mix where he, he does actually generate a lot of poise count, uh, and he benefits a lot from having the crits, but he doesn't generate much poise potency, and so the team can help with that in a way that's kind of unique. Uh, like, he'd be, normally, that would be kind of weird. Like, he generates kind of enough poise, but not enough actual crits. Uh, he's meant to do it with his skill, too. If they have a lot of bleed, then he gets crits. And would you look at that? Faust, with her Plum Blossom buff, could give him a lot of bleed to generate poise off of. Uh, I think he it's noteworthy that he has good synergy with, with Blade Lineage Faust. Uh, that might be something to consider if we're trying to decide who to cut. Uh, it might be worth putting these as a little bit of a couple. Uh, yeah, this is a very strong unit. Uh, he's tanky. Good stuff. I don't have a ton to say about his egos, though. Um, they're fine. You know, you, you added a lot of envy to the team, which is his favorite color, after all. Uh, the lust is a little questionable. Like, I don't know. I don't know that you're going to generate enough lust for, for that. Um, this is maybe doable. His holiday. Zayn Ego. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's all right. Um, I There's a, a good amount of lust asks. Uh, so I, I'm actually a little lukewarm on Harpooner Heathcliff, but I think he's a, a reasonable one to bring up, yes. 
Um, asymptomatic, I saw one that I, I thought was an interesting idea, which was K-Corp Hong Lu, not a poise ID, but for his regen passive. You said, I'm entertaining K bus K-Corp Hong Lu to latch onto Mersault's yield my flesh. Uh, getting healing when Mersault gets himself hit, uh, egoless healing that is not dependent on getting kills uh, is very nice. Gluttony 4 is quite a departure from the common Blade Lineage colors, though. Yes, I think the reason this is probably out for most Blade Lineage teams is there just isn't a way to run four relevant units that even have Gluttony skills. Uh, but in theory, the idea that uh, we could keep an eye out for sources of healing that are uh, not on kill and, you know, don't require using an Ego, uh, that would be very valuable for at least Mersault, because he wants to get hit to use his powerful counter. Yep. Uh, I think it is worth noting, while it's obviously still valuable to have the, the egoless healing, this team has pretty sick healing so far, provided we can get the Lust generation in order. Uh, we have Fluid Sack from Faust and Lantern from Sinclair, as well as Pursuance from Mersault, uh, provided we can get the Gloom in order, but it doesn't take much. Uh, the pretty good healing output. Um, I'm not, I, I'm okay personally, I would be okay with not running any more healing. Uh, I just think that's worth considering. I'm not saying it's at all a bad thing to think. Uh, ooh, okay, now we, we gotta talk about Pirate Gregor too, because uh, he's got that gloom, that gloom. Uh, I think that's where we're getting gloom, I don't know. I think that's where I'm getting gloom anyway. Uh, we'll see. Bree guy, welcome aboard. You said I needed to get on the Discord. Twitch sucks at giving live notifications. It does. Bree guy, I, um, there's always this thing that uh, slightly distresses me as a creator, where there are people in the world who really want to be told, you know, hey, get on this platform so you will get my go live notifications. But there are also a lot of people where that would annoy them. And so I think personally, I'm a bit of a coward about it and don't, I, I plug myself a little too little, so little that people who want the thing like legitimately don't know it exists sometimes. <laughs> um, so I, I feel I should apologize whenever that's a problem to people. Uh, and by way of apology, uh, we can do uh, a little bit of a drink of the day. Uh, I want to talk about Twin Hook Pirate Gregor first. Um, I think this unit is a great fit in a lot of ways. Uh, the, the Sloth generation, I've been taking it for granted, but when you look at it in aggregate, there's actually not that much on this theme, and this helps shore that up. He's a poise unit that is not blade lineage, but he generates a lot of poise, and so potentially he won't steal the buff from Dawn. That's maybe good. He has Gloom. Now, he doesn't have a lot of Gloom. We don't need a lot of Gloom, but he also has it as a dodge. Uh, valuable to have dodges, and that means we can get it on command if we need it. If we absolutely need the, the, the Gloom, we can have it. And finally, say it with me, a pride skill too, to activate Marisalt's passive. Um, he's a very good fit for the team, in my opinion. Uh, even better, he happens to have some bleed count on his skill 3, so should you keep Faust on the team, uh, he has a way to call to that a bit. Uh, I personally am the most excited at the moment by Sank Sinclair, Pequod Ishmael, and Twin Hook Gregor. Uh, and I think Harpooner Heathcliff is interesting, though I would be very excited to keep Faust if I were to do that. Um, I kind of want Faust with Twin Hook Gregor as well. I really like the, the Sinclair idea has really got me, like I think that's quite cool. Um, uh, Curry Race, you said Sang Sinclair with Dawn is interesting considering Sinclair only has skill 3 to gain potency. He stacks up count really well, but potency is something that's hard to build on him. That's true. Um, he That's like a weird thing about how Sinclair works, is kind of like Heathcliff. He has this mechanic where he eats poise count. He kind of uses it like charge instead of like poise, but I mean it is poise count and so you could use it for crits. Uh, this team could inject the poise potency that he's missing, for sure. Uh, very cool. Uh, there is some opportunity cost with passives that is is worth is worth discussing as well. Uh, let's let's hit up a drink of the day. I think I think it's uh, it, we're getting a bit wound up. You know, let's get let's get uh, unparched a little bit. And I do also want to look at the um, the sin affinities with different combinations of these units. I just think it's easier to see this way. Um, I think that f since no one has brought up anything about it, let's take as a given, as a starting point, that we're going to use Marisalt, Yisang, and Dawn. I think that is an interesting starting point, for what it's worth. 
And uh, yeah, basically the question is who else do you want to add? Um, there are not no other poise units. Uh, it's worth saying, you know, I I know that. <laughs> um, I, I hope obviously I know that, um, but I unless people want to bring up other ones, I think this is not a bad place to start for discussion. We don't have to cover every single thing. It's a discussion focused stream. It's not an encyclopedia. Oh, it's so, ooh, it's so crisp. Recently, I um, bungled my closet cleanup and fell, and my gigantic buttocks crashed into my tea tray, breaking it, and my tea strainer. And so I got a replacement from the, the this place that I order those from that sells them. And, I mean, you can't not pick up some tea, right? Come on, like, have a heart. And so I picked up uh, something I've been wanting to get into more lately, which is Chinese green tea. Uh, Chinese versus Japanese green tea is an interesting topic that, for another time, unless you really want me to talk about it right now. I wish I had more to say, too. Uh, but the long and the short of it is that a lot of Japanese green tea emphasizes freshness, like it's, it's basically just steamed to sort of fix, freeze the flavor in time. A lot of tea processing is about like getting it to make the delicious flavors after you pick the tea leaf and then doing something to it like heat treating it, steaming it or cooking it or something to kind of freeze or stop the that flavor in time. Kind of like blanching vegetables. And uh, in Japanese green tea, there's a real emphasis on the transparent flavor of ingredients. That's true in Japanese cuisine generally. That's a strong theme in, in Japanese food culture. A lot of Chinese green tea is like pan-fried instead, so it adds some cooked or kind of savory umami kind of flavors as well. Pretty cool. It's always sounded like something I'd really liked, but I had literally never had any Chinese green tea, at least not knowingly. So I got, uh, I got one. And it came with uh, the thing I always like to see when I order tea, which is a little card that has, oh, what's that? brewing information that my my camera will not focus on for you there eh, sort of brewing ratios because i have not normally brewed this kind of tea incredible uh come on like I, every tea needs to come with that it's i would pay more money like tea vendors listen i would pay maybe 10 to 20 percent more money most of the time for you to include brewing instructions for your tea like some of the time it makes a big difference now you can figure it out if it's really bitter, try brewing it as low as 80 degrees Celsius to favor the extraction of L-theanine. Like, I know a lot about brewing temperatures for tea, but having it be that, like, if you buy only a little tea, you're gonna mess up the little you have. Like, it's still a problem. I don't know. Uh, it comes in these, like, little packages. So these are measured for a single serving. Like, the brew ratio assumes you use one full package, so it's four grams. Uh, to 300 milliliters of water, 85 degrees Celsius for two minutes, then another steep for 30 seconds, and then another steep for 30 seconds. Uh, kind of a Western or like large format brew ratio, which I thought was interesting. Um, but it's common in green tea because it helps the leaves open up. Uh, you can actually see here. Look at those beautiful leaves. It just looks like green tea leaves, like still very pretty. Um, which is interesting because, of course, in the traditional Chinese style, they were probably, like, fried in a wok, <laughs> briefly. You know, I guess not with oil, but you know what I mean, like, tossed in a hot wok. Hmm. Oh. It's not, like, too green, you know, planty, right? You might have had green tea before that was, it was a bit vegetal, a bit grassy, like, not like delicious buttery grassy. Not grassy like some steak has a kind of grassy tasting note that can be tasty. Not like a hay tasting note. Like a tasting note that is like you ate a piece of grass. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and I, I have found so far that this one doesn't at all taste like that. It has like a rich, yeah, like fresh cut grass kind of smell. Um, but has like a, a savory taste. Like roasted vegetables in a positive way. It has that sweetness that uh, younger, less processed teas often have. Lots of L-theanine, which tastes sweet and mediates the experience of caffeine. Uh, it, it's just sweet and rich and like, oh, it's like if it's like if eating roasted vegetables was a dessert. Like, ooh, oh, it was so nice. Mm. Light, refreshing. Absolutely no bitterness. I didn't even like particularly take much care brewing it. And it's, it's just perfect. Like, oh, so good. Oh my goodness, it's so damn good. 
Uh, it's great. We've uh, It's been a treat. Drink of the day segments on the stream have been popping off lately. Uh, in any case, I will uh, chug that down while looking a little bit at Cinefinities. Um, a big question for me when tackling the Cinefinities for this theme is going to be uh, the Faust has a lot of the like needy egos, and so there's something to be said for eliminating Faust, making the the needs a lot less strict. You know, I'm I'm inclined to maybe start from not having Faust on the team and just doing this, and then again, slot order is something we'll do later. Um, and then I feel like the ego spread is really good. The resource spread is really good. So maybe we should start by looking at that. The Lust is bad. The Gloom is bad, that's another problem. Uh, so I, uh, that's something to think about. I kind of want to maximize Gloom as well, like put Faust on the team, but it's it's just not that much. You know, you're not actually adding that much. Uh, so I'm, I'm maybe more inclined to minimize the amount of Gloom needed. But even in this case, like if it's, it's basically just Marisalt's Chains of Others, and Ishmael's Blind Obsession, but th those are really good and I want to use them a lot. And it, like, we're not going to be able to use them. You know what I mean? Like, this team in no way adequately fuels those. Uh, so that's that's a whole thing. Now, we haven't looked at other Sank Association centers. Um, Freeze, welcome back. You said you could include Sank Otis. Um, I actually haven't looked at her yet. And she does solve some problems for this theme, you can see, just in terms of sins. Uh, we get a bit more Lust, that's okay, we're not using too much, but and we get a bit more. And then a, gl a Gloom skill 2, now we're getting a little closer to having the amount that would probably take care of the team's needs. And then, say it with me, a Pride skill 1, very nice. Pretty good Poise generation, Poise count generation. Uh, a lot of the Sank units have that, like, fairly squared away. I actually don't know what this unit gets at Uptie 4, so let's quickly take a look. Aggro... Ag more aggro, better final power on this skill, but it already has good final power. You get poise potency, but that's less of a big deal because this team can give her some. Uh, this is interesting. Yeah, so uh, certainly from a sin perspective, uh, Sank Udis solves some problems. I agree. Um, nice. Yeah, let's uh, let's put that there as a placeholder. Very nice. And we'll uh, we'll get into a full blown discussion, set up a team, and then we gotta schmoove. We gotta get into the dungeon. Uh, one of the challenges of doing a build brewery for Limbus Company is that if we have a meaningful discussion about what the team will be, it is hard to get into the hard part of a mirror dungeon with the team we just made. You know, it's a decently long piece of content for that. So uh, we'll see what we can do. We'll see what we can do. But uh, balancing that out is definitely gonna take practice. Uh, and of course, we can go back after we play a little of the Mirror Dungeon and look at, you know, did we like our choices? People are very fond of the um, the the zigzag. <laughs> we got to keep this team. The the pattern is just like delicious. That's beautiful. Um, I can get down with that. Ooh. Brie guy, I, I can relate to this. You said your description of the tea reminds me of when my family went sugarless for half a year and veggies started tasting a lot sweeter. Fresh carrots were amazing. Uh, I've done that. Yes, I, I know the experience. My partner and I have had this back and forth about uh, like the sweetness of tea. I think that my partner is not at all alone in essentially identifying if I say there's sweetness as a tasting note in like coffee or tea. We drink a ton of coffee and tea together. She especially drinks a lot of coffee with me. We're tasting just plain black coffee, just plain tea with nothing in it. Uh, and it has natural sweetness. Good quality coffee and tea has plenty of natural sweetness. But it's not like sugar sweetness, you know? Uh, it is definitely different. And I think for my partner, that just isn't sweetness. Like she'll often say, I really don't get that, you know, from this. I, I, I can find almost all of the other tasting notes that you're finding, she'll say, but I don't, it just, sweet is just not there, you know? Um, I've been trying to talk about it more as like sugar or like what kind of sweetness, you know, sweet like what? Um, obviously tasting notes, it's like, it doesn't taste like there is sugar in it. <laughs> Every tasting note needs to have a like before it, you know what I mean? Um, it doesn't taste like, it doesn't taste like it is roasted vegetables. It tastes 
like similar to, I guess similar to is what it needs in front of it, roast the vegetables. Um, I think that the, um, uh, I think that's a, a decent discussion point for tea as well. A brie guy, I've often wondered if that's why I'm picking up the sweetness more, because I just eat less sugar than my partner does. Uh, that's been on my mind for a while. I thought it was cool that that came up here. Um, Another thing that we haven't talked about that, that I think is a good thing to include at this part of the discussion is passives. Uh, Freeze, you said, the Poise team actually has a lot of decent support passives compared to other teams. Indeed, and I think it's worth looking at some of those now. Uh, one of them that I'm not sure we're going to get anywhere with, but I want to bring it up, is uh, Sinclair's Bloodied Hands passive. This is good. Uh, he's got, of course, the classic Mariachi Sinclair passive. He's got a lot of damage passives, but I think we can agree that Sank Sinclair is a, a worthy enough consideration. Uh, this this is a very, very good idea to consider for the team. And the other passives are just like modest damage that the team is like fine at enabling. Um, I'm not I'm not broken up about like not using a Sinclair passive. Um, I actually haven't looked at a lot of the others, though, if there are any you want me to focus on first, uh, we can do that. I'm going to quickly breeze through a few, because I just don't remember them. Udis, it's kind of a similar situation. There are a few very good, like obviously very powerful, but they are ultimately just like damage that most teams have access to. Uh, passives. Uh, there are some units that have very good poise passives, but they are even more ridiculously good on the team, and so I'm not entirely convinced that it makes sense to remove them. Uh, that is an interesting thing about Limbus Company. Like, Yisang is one of the better units on the team, and he has a very good poise generation passive, but he is so ridiculously powerful when on the team that I personally don't think this is a good reason to take him off. Um, this would be more like maybe a team that... Um, I think I've used this before on teams that splash poise. There are some units on the team that have some poise, but the team is like a bleed team or something. And he'll end up uh, getting put in as a support to fuel like some allies poise generation. Um, but I just think you lose so much by not running him on the core team. Uh, he's so powerful on, on this part of the team. And I think uniquely fun to use. Uh, he kind of builds up momentum. Same thing with Don. Uh, I would imagine that this is a nice passive to have. Uh, it's kind of a similar idea to the Yisong passive, but she's so uniquely good here and not really good anywhere else that I'm I, my personal preference is to definitely run her. Another thing worth noting, Curry Rice mentions that certainly in the context of a mirror dungeon, you, you may make little difference if you have the poise generation passives because ego gifts will take you the rest of the way. Uh, but at the same time, I still think I'm happy you brought that up, Freeze. I think that's a thing that the Poise team has in spades. Lots of places where you might consider cutting the units with the actual Poise because their passives are very good. Um, this is a modestly powerful passive too, um, but Greg is insane uh, here, I think. So I don't know. I actually kind of feel like the this team is not in a great place for passives. Um, this is pretty good. Uh, when the ally first deployed in the pre-battle team setup critically hits, they inflict defense level down up to three times per enemy per turn. Uh, I think this is very, very strong. Uh, this is basically free because it's just owned pride. Uh, and if that unit is, let's say, Marisalt, it's all slash. Uh, he will frequently apply the max amount and no more in a given turn. I, I think this is an in incredibly strong passive for this team. Uh, defense level down will give you, a, it's like 3% more damage or something like that. Um, it's a nice damage increase. And again, it's almost completely free. It will just always happen. Uh, I just whacked my mic, so if you heard a loud noise. Another passive that I had been using before, you might have seen briefly at the start of the stream, is Heathcliff, uh, She Heathcliff's support passive. It's basically a Wrath version of that one Ryoshu default passive. Uh, if you do three Wrath chain, uh, you have one ID, do, just do 20% more damage, but they also take 20% more damage. I think this is still pretty strong. The main risk, I think, would be if Marisalt has gotten hit because you're using Yield My Flesh to claim their bones, and then he does it again, and then that passive triggers, this is a Wrath skill, I, he might take more damage than you want, but I think for the most part that's I mean, if he if he doesn't die, he's then going to slaughter the entire enemy side because he's doing 20% more damage. Um, I think this is a very, very good passive. 
I'm kind of not sold on Pequod Harpooner Heathcliff. Not only did we cut, uh, it's it's not a huge deal, but a little bit of the support from Faust and her bleeds. Um, I also, yeah, like he, he doesn't bring a lot unique to the team. His sin affinities are things the team ha has or can have mostly covered, although the envy output would be nice. It's not the end of the world. Um, his egos are not particularly good for this theme, in my opinion. Uh, he's not doing a lot unique for this team, in my opinion. And you could accomplish many of his benefits on a pride team. I, a bleed team. Well, a pride team, too. Um, so, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of happy to cut Pequod Heathcliff. Um, but I would be quite interested to, to try weaving him and Faust together. Uh, another time we can talk about how I might fiddle with my bleed team now that we have access to all these new units. Like, at the moment, I'm using uh, Lobotomy Court Faust, but I think I am quite keen to swap in uh, Blade Lineage Faust in this slot. Uh, I think that works just fine on this theme. She doesn't have an Envy skill explicitly to chain with Dawn, Middle Dawn, uh, in her Envy Unga Bunga thing, but she does have... Uh, sex nail, baby. Uh, so you can just do another envy whenever you want. Uh, and better yet, this idea is fast, so it will hit before uh, these other people doing big envy damage. I think this is sick, actually. Like, that's awesome. The more I think about that, the more I think, hell yeah, that's gonna be so good. Uh, I, I think, anyway. But a topic for another time. Uh, just to say, I could see doing a version of this theme that runs these two. One of the many reasons that I, I insist so strongly on these heavy discussion-focused, option-focused build discussion streams is that this is one of the places where it can be valuable. Like, if you just recommended this team, you were so close to some players having an awesome, really fun, really unique recommendation if you just showed that throughout that thought process we were quite close to running this other thing, you know? Um, some people will just have those units and not these, or prefer them, or I don't know, do both variants. Like, you you don't have to make one poise theme. We got like a million team slots. Thank you, Project Moon. Uh, very cool. Uh, I want a million team slots in every game. Uh, yeah, good stuff. Freeze, yeah, another good point is um, First Mate, uh, Pequod First Mate, Yisong, would also be pretty solid on this theme. Uh, a good poise and bleed hybrid identity. Uh, though, again, I would go on to argue he's even better on this theme. Uh, this team really fits the Pequod squad. <laughs> That's fun. Very neatly. Um, and then this is a happy accident. And then the, t the, it, the team is just beautiful and crisp. Ooh, so nice. Uh, I love it. And for me, that's a, that's a lot of my bias, right? Like, I'm happy to play lots of different teams. Not every player is going to be like that. Asymptomatic, you often say you really don't like playing a huge range of teams. Uh, you have kind of a workhorse team or your pet team. Uh, I hope I'm not misrepresenting that. That sounds like how you felt in the past. Um, I know plenty of players are like that. They don't want to run, like, every single type of team. I do, for one reason or another. Uh, is it because it's my job and it's my job because that's the thing I like to do? Yes, that's why. Um, but for me, it's like, if I will use the unit somewhere else, I'm much happier to just leave them, you know, for a given team. For example, I'm, uh, I, I don't insist on not running Ishmael on this team. I think she'll be a fun addition. I want to try that. But I'm less interested in running her because I am going to get use out of her on this team already. That's just me. Yeah, so let's um let's get going. The last thing that I think is worth doing is passives and uh looking at the order is another big thing. Um so let's let's look at passives briefly. So this is really, really good, we discussed. Um we haven't talked about Rodian this entire time. Default Rodian has a very good passive for this theme that gives us uh twenty percent damage on a unit with their heads coins. Uh this is crazy, and again this theme will activate it very easily. Uh, very, very strong passive. I'm still kind of keen to put Udis in. Maybe I'll take off Ishmael and put Udis in. You lose Gloom. I mean, um, Envy. But you also lose a lot of the need for the Envy. I kind of want to try Udis on this theme, but I also don't have her leveled up. It would, it would give the Gloom generation a real shot in the arm, but also you benefit less from the Gloom generation getting a shot in the arm because you don't have Blind Obsession because you cut Ishmael. Um... That's hard. It's hard. I don't know. I, I kind of do want to run Udis, but I'm not sure. I feel like there's room. 
excuse me. That was my excitement to drink the delicious tea. And uh, I plopped it down right on top of my water glass. Looks like someone wants to hydrate. We have base Hong Lu to fix that. Um, the Sanity from Ishmael, yep. Um, uh, that's another very good passive for this theme. A little boring, but uh, I think this is very strong. This is a great passive anyway, and this theme should activate it pretty easily. Um, the, the Sloth isn't getting spent that many places, and so Greg, if he stays on the team, combined with Dawn, should be enough. Um, it's not, not that many people are using it, it's mostly Pursuance on Mersault. Uh, so we should have the Sloth, and this is a great Sanity passive. Uh, the strength of this, I think, compared to the other ones, is that there are a few passives that generate Team Sanity. They're mostly Ysang and Mersault passives, but that's by the by. Um, I, what I like about this one is it has no condition. You just always restore Sanity for an ally. Um, I have not ever had a problem with Ishmael's sanity loss from her like unique sanity mechanics. We talked about that previously. She loses sanity uh, if she's like not the one to kill allies, basically, uh, enemies. Um, but I personally have not found that relevant. Um, it's not it's not nothing. you know, it is a slight loss to her consistency. Uh, but it doesn't make her, like, have low sanity, in my experience. It just means she will have a little less, which slightly balances her out. I think I would definitely rather go LCB Honglu rather than uh, Freeze, nice, good timing, uh, Ting Tang Honglu. Uh, you could run to just increase your damage output. Um, I think it's possible this team will have a little trouble with the owned gluttony. Uh, it's basically just Sinclair generating it, but he does generate a good amount. Uh, so, I don't know. I mean, I'm happy to go for the Sanity Restoration. Uh, let's look at Ryoshu, and then I'm not really sure what to do about Uda, so let's leave this ID here. Not bad to have a backup combatant, either. Uh, Ryoshu IDs. Now, we can just use her LCCB Assistant ID, which has a passive that kind of pairs up with Twinhook Gregor. If he shoots his last ammo, um, if he's spending ammo, he, he gets poise. Um, this is a very nice passive, but it does literally nothing for everybody except Twinhook Gregor, so it could still be worth considering other passives. Um, I'm not sure there are any that are that relevant here. The usual really strong support healing when you kill someone, but I'm not sure this team is going to be that easily able to achieve 5 owned lust if it wants to spend the lust as well. So I'm kind of mad about that. I have no idea what this one does. This is a burn ID, so it's going to be some burn thing, yep. Uh, this is the Gluttony version of that Heathcliff passive I'm using, but we're not going to be able to chain 3 Gluttony. Uh, this is Rupture, this is Charge, this is Bleed, I believe. Yeah, um, so I, I, I think I'm going to give it to the Shotgun uh, Ryoshu, and it's, it's owned Pride, so very easy to activate too. Uh, cool, so let's um let's do the slot order. Uh, people are quite eager about this. Uh, Curry Racy said, are you going to set Ishmael, is that it, as the slot one? Um, yeah, that's hard. Uh, I, I'm very inclined to put Mersault as the slot one because then he gets more sort of the homeland uses to other Blade Lineage allies. Uh, he gets more chances to chain his own pride to activate resonance. Uh, he gains more poise and therefore shares it to more allies. Um, but this can this can only ever affect Blade Lineage allies, so in a team that is only half Blade Lineage, I'm a little bit more hesitant to have that be. I'm, I'm maximally prioritizing just these three units, you know? Um, so I think it's a real question whether Mersault takes the number one slot now. Uh, yeah. And Ishmael gives the team more actions because this skill uh, having good resonance will activate assist attack. So perhaps it makes more sense to bring Ishmael. Now on this team, another tactic that I like the idea of, Curry Rice, you said, you could also set people who have more unique sin colors as the earlier slots and then swap around later when the strength of the units matters more. Yep, I think that's a very relevant issue on this theme. Uh, you can generate a lot more 
Gloom if you let Greg go first. And there's actually one other related trick that I want to talk about. Because Dawn will give poise, potency, and count respectively to the units with the least poise, and you get more if they're blade lineage units, there's this weird incentive to give the extra slots in normal fights to the non-blade lineage units so they have more poise, and then Dawn makes up the difference for the blade lineage allies. Does that make sense? The idea being that we would do something like Ishmael, uh, Greg Sinclair, Mersol, I guess Yisong Dawn, or Dawn Yisong. Um, but then having Dawn be later in the order means that the fact that these have more poise and therefore you give more poise to these other units that have less poise will happen less because she's later in the order, but that's why it would work. And so, ah, bah, 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 analysis paralysis. Ah, bah, 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 bah. Um, I, I don't like putting Mersault so late, though. Um, it would be worth looking at the passives as well, like one issue with Ishmael first is that this wants us to have the first deployed ally do slash, and so putting Mersault first first, um, I, I think is still valuable, or an all slash unit being like first first, which, uh, Yisong, it could be, but I think Mersault is the, the happy accident. The, that's not what that normally means. Um, let's do this. I don't know. Um, let's no. Let's not take it for a test run because we only have limited time during the stream. How about that? Let's get in there. Uh, but that that's my uh, that's my best attempt. Uh, poise, please. Let's, I guess, reroll. Power up is good. Though, pendant is nice. Let's reroll, though. Horseshoe, hey. We ride. Ishmael is just going to leech all the poise spreading from Dawn. She doesn't generate much on her own. Well, she's not going to leech all of it because Dawn hits, um,. Two. Does this hit two, or am I lying? This this one hits two. Uh, it's true. The the blade arc passive only hits one target. So one drawback of Ishmael here is she is going to eat all that poise. Uh, it's it's looking more and more like it would be really nice to run Sank Udis. We can swap them in and out throughout the run too, potentially. Uh, this ruined the team order that I just did, but it's fine. Let's just do it again. Uh, earlier. Asymptomatic, I wanted to get back to the comment you made about the Blade Lineage event. Uh, I guess I, I can just respond to it off the top of my head. Basically, you were saying it's worth noting that at the time of this recording, uh, there is a Blade Lineage event going on, and so the... There are a couple of Ego Gifts that specifically buff Blade Lineage units. I will just avoid getting them as much as possible. I don't think it particularly affects the evaluation of this discussion. In the first place, I think a bigger point for me is that I'm I'm not really trying, I'm certainly not claiming to provide like an objective evaluation of the power level of the team. I don't think that's relevant in games that have meaningful build options. If you make well-reasoned decisions, the the build is going to be like of a reasonable power level for the content. I personally think that the the uh, relatively accurate picture of the power level is just not a thing that matters much <laughs> um, in these streams. But I am I'm purposefully giving a strong version of the opinion to see what people think. Um, I I think it's still somewhat relevant. Obviously, creating an ultra specific situation, unique only to you can see where I'm going. Like that would be bad. I'm not going to purposefully skew it away from most people's situation. But neither do I think that it's particularly important to make sure it's the most objective, you know, it wouldn't be anyway, because we're only doing one run. Um, Asymptomatic, thank you for reposting that. I'll, I'll just read what you said anyway, though, because I still think it's a relevant point. You said, I do think it's partially disingenuous to review Blade Lineage while the event-specific gifts are up, though the game is encouraging players to use those identities anyway. When better to run those allies, when there is both a carrot and a spoon to do so. 
Uh, ah, yes, a carrot and a spoon. Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, right, it's like there are still incentives to run these together. Uh, we're not making team building decisions based on the ego gifts. And again, I think it's fine to just, like, if we get them, I could just sell them too. Uh, I don't think it's a huge deal. We'll auto through, through the first few floors so that we can actually get to the harder stuff. Um, I still think it's relevant to vaguely get up there. And it's practical to auto the first few floors, so it is interesting to see how the team performs if you, like, just go, you know, if the team just brawls. Uh, while I would be, you know, still interested in a really cool team that requires a lot of manual play, it's some nice quality of life if you can fairly easily beat the first few floors and then focus on the harder floors. Uh, that's relevant. You know, if you're doing a mirror dungeon every single week, it's nice to be able to breeze through the first few floors. So, I like to see how the team does as an auto team. This one, I think it will do very well. Uh, and the reason is that the, the poise generation is, is quite solid across the units, and then the team has support to generate more poise as well. So it shouldn't be all that difficult. And I also think that poise teams tend to do pretty well in like uh, medium length encounters. The encounter isn't that hard, but the team builds up massive damage. Like when you do daily experience and there's two phases, like two waves of enemies, the second wave, this team just wrecks house. Like you, you, you win so much faster than other teams would, potentially at the minor expense of building up good poise during the first wave. Um, but I found that to be really, really satisfying. That's a really nice perk of poise teams. Um, you can also see that the team has enough uh, pride skills that Mersault's passive, which wants you to chain three pride out of your six starting skills, often activates automatically without you manually chaining three pride skills just because there's so much pride. And you could do it manually. Uh, it's not so hard to just uh, drag a random chain but target the blue skills, you know? Uh, there's something between like doing it fully manually and doing it fully automatic. Um, and I think that's that's easy uh, on this kind of team. You know, if I hit auto here, it's gonna give me three pride skills, but you can imagine if I just like was half paying attention and chained a bunch of pride, like that's not that hard to do either. Uh, I think that's meaningful. I often, uh, Freeze, you said, I don't really tend to auto much. I enjoy manual play even when I grind normal mirror dungeons. Yeah, and sometimes I'm in the same boat. I, I just like to do it manually because it's fun. Uh, it's nice to be able to do it automatic uh, when there isn't much of a benefit to not doing so. I think that's still relevant for a lot of players. Uh, but I agree. Personally, I like to just assign them manually. It's fun to play. I just think it's still relevant to look at how the team does auto. Mostly, I think the auto mechanic is relevant for the game's well-balanced difficulties as a way to uh, to just end a fight that you've basically won. Like my example in the experience runs, I'll manually chain through uh, the first wave, and then in the second wave I'll hit win rate or damage, um, because I'm clearly going to win, I just wanted to end sooner. I think this is a huge thing that I'm pleased to see more of in, um, in turn-based games generally, which is this idea that the turn-based fight is often gonna kind of piddle out toward the end. So I've seen some good ideas recently for game design that tries to make sure that it, the boring, when, when the fight has been decisively won but isn't technically over, you can end it as quickly as possible. Does that make sense? The win rate button is one interesting version. Um, I did see another... Uh, piece of design that I thought was cool that I'll briefly talk about. Um, th this idea was that if you have a game like um, Dungeons and Dragons, or like a tabletop role-playing game, this is from the tabletop role-playing game being developed by MCDM, uh, Matthew Colville, and, and Co, if you're familiar. I don't want to give credit to only him, he's just the person whose name I know from that group. Um, chat wants the damage button, so I'll hit it. We, we can. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, they're doing this thing where the fights are designed such that you build up resources over the course of the fight, so that when you have decisively won the fight, you do the most damage. And therefore, it's like what just happened, right? You're building up poise, and then when you've decisively won, the tactical part of the encounter has ended and you have come out victorious, you gained damage by winning tactically, and therefore you slaughter the enemies in a matter of seconds, and the fight ends you know, in short order now that you've done the thing. Um, I think that is very cool. Like, that's awesome. A uh, very cool way to do it. 
uh, to some extent, poise themes are like that. The idea that rather than allowing the player to go autopilot when it's no longer interesting to play manually, which is kind of what the win rate and the damage buttons are, uh, is also not a bad solution. Both, both, uh, you know, for a tabletop game, I don't know how you would do that. Um, but the idea that, uh, that you could implement both is pretty interesting to me. I've been playing Baldur's Gate 3 to death, just to death, uh, for the past few months with uh, my partner and I are doing a playthrough, my friend and I are doing another playthrough, and I'm also doing a solo playthrough. <laughs> so that's the amount of that game I'm playing. And um, I, while I don't think it matters that often, I would really like a sort of like win rate or like do damage button in that game. There are times where like the final turn of a fight, you have clearly won, but you do technically need to hit that last guy. And having it be turn-based can make a very tedious decision uh, just easier, you know, just go away instead. Um, I think that's nice. Uh, but having more robust systems like that is, I think, really cool. Uh, it's interesting how much there is to add to turn-based combat, don't you think? Like, you can really improve a lot uh, about what seems like a simple thing. It's been exciting to see more of that as um, Wizards of the Coast failure to make D&D into anything but uh, a growing cash crab, as much as I've enjoyed D&D for what it is, if you just ignore them, um, has led to a, a ton of really cool new games. And they've had some very cool design uh, that I think there's stuff to take from. And it's really avoiding selecting three, uh, <laughs> three pride skills, eh? Anyway, um, just the thing. Chrononix, welcome aboard. How you doing? What's up? Uh, you came in the middle of uh, the way that poise teams kind of build up damage over the fight made me think a little bit about, uh, I've been interested in the way that turn-based games kind of end things once you've won uh, recently. I hope that that probably made sense through context, but I wanted to briefly summarize. Uh, yeah, I mean, so in, in the MCDM game, I didn't really talk about those mechanics that much because I don't know about them, <laughs> but an example they gave was like rage. In a lot of games, there will be a martial character or a berserker character that builds up a resource as they attack and take damage, and they can spend it to do like finisher moves. You could think of it like maybe adrenaline is a nice name for that mechanic. Um, in actual D&D 5th edition, rage is very different, but there is a mechanic often called rage in a lot of other games. Uh, that is like, yeah, you build up the resource as you fight, usually take damage and do damage, and then you can spend it on what are often basically finisher moves. Uh, and I think that's a really good mechanic for a turn-based game. It means that when you have, again, tactically won, you can use big burst damage to do a incredibly cinematic and badass, but also decisive fight-ending blow. Uh, very cool. Uh, that's a, a fun idea, a very elegant idea, I think. Let's avoid this. Just to say about autoing a little bit more, Freeze, you said, although if you're grinding hard mirror dungeons, you'd really be inclined to manual play at the end floors, because one mistake can cause a lot of damage. Of course, I mean, so I've been saying before, but to clarify, what I frequently do, having limited time on the stream, is auto the first two or three floors because they will be easy with a fully leveled team that is like well designed. Um, I haven't yet played a team that didn't stomp floors, you know, one, two, kind of three, um, if it is a well structured team. But then floors four and five, that quickly changes as more enemy buffs build up as the enemy level increases, and then because you autoed through floors one, two, maybe three, uh, you have more time. Usually, we end up having more time to focus on those fights where, as you say, you will die if you don't. Um, I think that's a great compromise for the stream, for the way I often play anyway. Um, and I think it's nice that the game can do both. One thing that's valuable to me about Limbus Company and similar games is they kind of, your build kind of just goes to some extent. Uh, you make it, and then you just get to sort of watch the thing happen. It's very good for discussing build decisions, don't you think? You get to see we talk about the ideas we have when making the team, and then we get to see how the team performs in practice, but without the cost of spending as much energy on actually piloting the team through that situation in practice. Um, I think that is a, a happy accident is putting it pretty lightly. I think it's even better than that, um, but a, a very nice aspect of uh, streaming games like this. 
Uh, it lets us focus, like, watch the team in action while I can focus 100% of my attention on discussing the team, allowing us to almost simultaneously play and discuss the team, uh, because the team can be made to play itself. Uh, and, and yet, there are times when you manually play through things too. I really, really like that balance. Uh, I would like even more games like that. Another game that I think does that fairly well, not in the same way, is Arknights. Uh, I've also enjoyed uh, God of Weapons and Snakers. S-N-K-R-X is how that one is spelled. Um, I don't know how to pronounce that, Snakers, um, for similar reasons. Uh, they don't always work the same way as this, where you literally hit a button to go auto or not, um, but they have all been games that satisfied my interest in being able to make a build and kind of just watch it go, but also there is a manual component as well. I think that's a very fun balance for making builds in games. And it's very nice that at the same time it's like elegantly solves that design problem, where if it's turn-based combat, you will want to just get it over with once you've decisively won, and it, it's a happy accident that that does that too. <laughs> yeah, I hate this fight. Uh, it um, it uh, is often quite easy, but just takes forever because you have to wait for their invulnerability to wear off. You silly sort of don't, but uh, anyway. Um, Yeah, um, just to go back briefly, Curry Rice, you said the sin and ego system in Limbus Company is also kind of like that design idea I described where you kind of gain resources and then spend them into a finisher. The entire structure of mirror dungeon runs is often like that. I'll save up resources for the first few floors and then spend them to finish off the harder fights in the run. Uh, very cool. And that's a nice thing about Limbus Company too, where like the stakes increase as the run goes on. Uh, and you have stronger abilities, but the stakes are also higher. You can use your powerful egos, but you lose sanity as you use them, so you don't want to use them too much, and you can run out of resources, and uh, it, it's nice, like very juicy. You're right, uh, upon examination, Limbus Company actually does that thing a lot. Uh, I, that was somehow not immediately obvious to me. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Yes, you're absolutely right. Greg cracking him over the head. Hey, since we're here briefly, we talked a lot in the team building section about whether Dawn is going to be giving poise with her skill 2 and 3 to Blade Lineage allies or not. Let's just look at who has the least poise currently. Obviously it's always going to be Ishmael, but her skill 3 gives it to two people. So who is the other person? It's not Greg, uh, I'm pleased to see. Uh, he is, as predicted, outpacing the rest of the team significantly, uh, at least in this context. Uh, so it's interesting to see that we don't really need to worry about uh, we are going to get some on a Blade Lineage ally. That's cool. Uh, Mr. Fruit, yeah, Nova Drift is another game that can have that, that kind of like, it goes automatically when you want it to, uh, but also has some, t you know, tense tactical moments. Yep, that's a good example as well. You could do a whole, um... You could do a whole spectrum of like how much games feel like that. Uh, the the sort of vampire survivors, I've heard that that genre or gameplay loop called a bullet heaven before. Uh, the games where you're usually your build just fires off and you just move around, avoiding enemies, uh, and um, and uh, th those games uh, often have this balance where you usually just watch your build on autopilot but sometimes there's these tense moments of movement whereas i would consider nova drift a game that's kind of the opposite you usually manually pilot but there can be some moments where it just kind of happens and it depends on the difficulty level you're playing too that's a whole thing freeze you made a good point one of the reasons that um that greg has so much poise is because we're getting help from the pendant ego gift which prioritizes gloom units uh, so that's part of why he has so much more than other allies, but I mean that is a common ego gift, uh, so I still think that's worth thinking about, but yes, that's a good point. It, again, it's quite difficult to get to objective data, but thank you for mentioning that because I didn't immediately notice. Most of the way through floor two. Um, let's break here, I think. 
uh, we the time is about right to break. Um, eh, these are all sort of. Eh. I kind of want to pick this, but if I don't, then the enemies get less levels, which is good. This says when hitting an enemy with a blunt or pride affinity skill, you do sanity damage, and if they have less than zero sanity. Uh, allies with less than zero sanity do 10% more. That's not that relevant. I'll take Fiery down and just sell it, I think. This would give me another Ego Gift, but I think it's more valuable to keep the enemy buffs down. Um, so let's do... Uh, let's take Fiery down. I'm going to... Uh, yeah, enhance the Pendant the rest of the way. Two random allies, nice, okay. Um, do we need the heal? Eh, kinda, Greg, uh, Mersault. Ysang needs it a little bit too, and Sinclair needs it. I'll take the I'll take the AoE one. Yep. Cool, okay, let's pause here. Uh, Curry Rice, I thought this was interesting. Um, you were talking about Egos as like finisher abilities since we were we were on that before. Uh, the idea uh, you were talking about is that egos can be kind of confused for some people as a kind of ultimate or like finisher attack. Um, you said I see a lot of new players think using them when they stagger an enemy makes sense when in reality a lot of normal skills do way more damage. Yes, that is a strange aspect of Limus Company. Egos are, are really designed to be a better way to clash enemies, not usually a better way to do a lot of damage. There are a few designed that way, but because hits on attacks are usually the way you do the most damage, and Egos usually only have one coin, they always do currently, but that's sort of a whole separate topic. Why? Anyway, uh, yes, usually they end up doing less damage. They're more about like tactically decisively winning the fight, and then that moment that people are used to from most other games, where the enemy's vulnerable and you unload all your damage, looks different in Limbus Company than in similar games. Right, that's an interesting aspect that I know about. You know, I, I know that egos don't do more damage when uh, most of the time, because they hit less times. Uh, I use, you use them to clash, to get the enemy staggered often, rather than like once they are staggered. But that's a good point. I uh, Whether or not you've seen a lot of players do that, it's pr hopefully pretty obvious to most people that that is how many players would interpret egos. Uh, that is an interesting aspect of designing them that way. Hmm. I say this a lot when this kind of thing comes up, but I'll say it again here because I think it's just as much addressing the issue. Uh, developers, you could solve pretty much all these things by just saying in the game in plain English, Egos are good when you want to counter an enemy's powerful attacks. Normal attacks normally do more damage. Like, just say those exact words in the game. The tutorial has space for them. Uh, slight shade to Limbus Company's tutorial. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, um, I would like to see games kind of do better about that. I feel like this is kind of a non-issue if the game just says that's what they're meant to be good for, uh, or makes that more obvious somehow. Uh, but I, I agree that that's an interesting point. A lot of similar games, the egos would be like your big damage move, which some of them are, but mostly they're not. Yep. Uh, just since we were talking about it before, and I think it's an interesting subject, before we break, Jaman, you said the way Lancer, D&D with mechs, handles it is to go full war game with it and put a time limit on the turn-based fight, like a, a limit on turns, I guess, and send a steady flow of enemy reinforcements to pressure players until the last second. Right, uh, having the objective not be to kill everything means it will probably be tense right up until the wire. You can start balancing fights the other way, where there, you get overwhelmed and it's becoming impossible to win, and then you just barely survive enough turns, or kill enough enemies to survive enough turns, and then you win, something like that. Uh, that's a cool way to do it too, yep, to, re to kind of reduce uh, the, the pittering out of tension in a... Uh, turn-based game. That's cool. I'm gonna write that down. Pair it with the other ones. Imagine the ultimate experience where you pair all these together. Also, uh, we had talked about uh, building up resources for finishers during fights. 
and also auto option to clean up shop once you've tactically, but not technically, won. Very cool, yes. Faust is mocking me for taking too long to get the break going, so what are you going to do? A uh, quick thank you to folks for supporting the show, and then we'll uh, we'll take a break and finish our run. Mr. Fruit Rorthex and Curry Rice, thank you very much for the subs. Thanks for supporting the show. You are the reason I can keep doing this. Without your support, I would not be able to. So thank you very much. It means a lot. And Chrono Nix, I hope you've enjoyed hanging out so far. I also got a follow from someone while I was offline yesterday. Exoid, thanks for the follow. Welcome aboard. And thanks to all the new followers on the bottom of the screen as well. Cursed Teeny, I feel like you've been on the stream a while. Did you just follow? Anyway, welcome aboard. Uh, glad to have you folks. Cool, talk to y'all soon. Hello, and welcome back to my Twitch archive parlay. The part of the show where I hit the restroom, try to keep me entertained while I do so, by answering a few questions from folks who've watched previous streams. This one is from The Last Curry Rice, who says, There are some PvP games where alternate win condition gimmicks can be made on some cards or units because the opponent can assess it and prevent your win. How could you implement an alternate win condition for single-player games in a way that it doesn't end up being the best way to approach every encounter? Interesting. Um, I understand the logic that you're referring to, but I am going to briefly explain it in case it's not obvious to other people. So what you're pointing out is that in, in a, a, a competitive game between two players, Oftentimes the game can allow there to be a, a primary goal, like reduce the opponent's health to zero, or kill all their stuff, or whatever. And it's okay for them to add a mechanic that is an alternate win condition, like uh, burn through all their resources, or, you know, destroy all the cards in their deck, you know, rather than just, you know, eliminating their life total or whatever. And that works and, and can be balanced because it's something that the opponent can do something about. They can hopefully realize that you're, oh, you're trying to do this instead. And then they have some recourse where they can like prevent you from doing that. Another thing that's really common that's pretty related is that oftentimes pursuing that alternate win condition comes at the cost of your standing in the primary win condition. In other words, it makes your opponent have an easier time beating you the normal way because you are trying to beat them in an alternate way. And so what you're saying is, you know, that can work okay in competitive games, but what about when, you know, the 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 computer in the in the game is programmed to stop you from like killing their units, but you're doing a separate goal that's like if you assemble the five pieces of Exodia or the three pieces of the Triforce, then you go unga bunga ooga booga blast and all their stuff dies. How can you make that uh, balanced or work in one of these games? I think that to some extent the answer is related to how it's done in those competitive games because, I, I was trying to point out, one of the mechanics that is making that work is that usually it's related to the primary win condition. So in other words, if you have to play quite defensively and deal with the consequences of doing so, I'm imagining something like in Limbus Company, imagine if you had to get your entire charge team to 30 charge and then you would go ooga booga and do a ton of damage all at once. It would kind of be an alternate win condition, but imagine if it was structured in a way where you had to play quite defensively. Now in Limbus Company normally, you don't frequently take a lot of enemy attacks unopposed, but imagine if for some reason you did need to do that to win this alternate way. You have a way to, to maybe get around needing to clash the opponent in Limbus Company, but you don't necessarily have an advantage completely, because you have to deal with the consequences of getting hit way more than you normally would, having enemy debuffs stack up on you a lot more than they normally would, not getting the benefits of the effects on your unit's attacks when they hit, like when they attack and stuff. There are various problems. Sanity gain would also be a problem in Limbus Company, and so there would be ways that it would be balanced out. That's one thing. Another way to look at it is that a sort of alternate win condition you could view as pretty niche. And so one way to help balance them generally is simply to make it so they are bad, just straight up, they're not good, unless you really commit to them. And so it comes at the cost of the team being more flexible somehow. But even so, I, I think that you are, it is smart of you to hit on the idea that this seems kind of inherently hard to balance to make uh, interesting, fun, 
good, but not just the obviously best way to deal with everything. If there's a, a kind of static opponent, you know, the computer against you, I, I think that that is a smart realization because the computer will perhaps just act in a, a predictable way. And because you can kind of count on that, you can plan your alternate win strategy to minimize the effects of the actions you basically know the computer is going to take while you do something else. Uh, that is an interesting way to look at it. Now, I do think in Limbus Company, we have a kind of soft example that I don't have too much to say about, but I'll just mention. We have gotten some units recently that have a very powerful attack that they can do to the opponent, but they can only do it after getting hit. They either have to lose Clash on purpose, or they use a counter skill where they get hit for sure no matter what, and then they counter attack back. And they have to deal with the various consequences of getting hit. That's why I used that as an example before. <laughs> um, they might get staggered, they get status effects on them, you know, various stuff, but in exchange, they do a very powerful attack back. You'll have to heal them up over time, you know, etc. You don't stop the opponent's attack. And so it's kind of more acceptable for their attack to be very powerful back because one the attack's clashing power is irrelevant they give up clashing and two they got hit in return which is usually pretty punishing in limbus company you can die in only a few hits and so the idea that that attack can be very very strong because it's kind of counterbalanced or power budgeted by you getting hit makes a lot of sense. That is a kind of very, very small, teensy-weensy alternate win condition in Limbus Company. That type of thing interests me a lot. I thought of Magic the Gathering a lot during this parlay, and a lot of those alternate win conditions I'm not a fan of. I don't think that they do this thing that you're describing, I agree, would be a good way to have alternate win conditions be interactable. I think the problem with a lot of them in Magic the Gathering is that they, re they, they maybe could be in theory, but they're just not. Uh, they maybe took the idea that this is niche and so you can make the effects strong a little too far. And it, looking into some of the power that uh, mill strategies where you destroy your opponent's deck instead of their life total, those strategies often get ludicrously powerful cards if you translate them into like, this is just damage direct to your opponent's face. And they like are damage direct to your opponent's face. <laughs> they're, they're, in no way are they not that. It's just that they're, I guess, not as flexible, but you would just never play them when they're not. There's a whole discussion I would have if we had more time about how um, the, the idea of something being niche can be problematic to balance around. I think it's important to be careful to balance niche effects, assuming they will be used when they are good. Too often effects are balanced in a way where they're kind of weak, normally, but really powerful in their niche because they'll, like, they're only good when they're used in their niche. I, I don't know. I think if players know what they're doing, the card will never see play except in its niche. So you should assume it needs to be balanced, like, only when being used in its niche. Who cares how good it is when it wouldn't be good? You want to balance it for when it would be good. When you say it that way, it sounds like obviously. But uh, anyway, I think that's a, a pitfall relevant to this topic. Very interesting. I want to talk about this more, so I went a little over time. But uh, let's talk about it more, uh, maybe right after this. But I would love to hear more about this. Folks, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this little break. If you'd like to submit your own questions for these segments, you're watching live, you can click that link I'm posting in chat right now. Submit a question, and I'll answer it this time next week. You'd be doing me a favor, I'd have something to talk about during these segments. For now, on with the show. And a few other quick thank yous to folks who are supporting the show before we continue. Welcome back. Grey Ghost, thanks for becoming my most recent patron. Thanks for supporting the show. Uh, you are a normal tier patron, just helping make things possible, both the YouTube videos on my various channels and this. So thanks very much for your support, I really appreciate it. And Asymptomatic, thank you for the recent $32.09 tip. You can always tell us an Asymptomatic tip, not only because I haven't made the scrolls long enough to contain the name, but also because of the bespoke amount in dollars and cents. Uh, but that bespoke amount is only matched by the degree to which you tip a lot. Uh, that's very generous of you. Thank you very much for your support. Let's continue our adventure. Uh, just earlier, I found funny, asymptomatic, you said, uh, alternate win conditions teeter on having future backing as well. Yu-Gi-Oh! is the main specimen in my wheelhouse, where sometimes an archetype or faction has a goal they strive for, but then they go without new booster packs or structure decks for years. The card writers or game designers, whatever, have to kind of do it right while the printing press is hot. Guess where most archetypes end up on the spectrum? Yes, while I have not played 
uh, Yu-Gi-Oh for a very long time. I remember uh, early on in Yu-Gi-Oh's lifespan seeing the Toon archetype. These are like variant, more powerful versions of various monsters already in the game, but you can only summon them while you have a Toon World out, which is like an, a, a sort of enchantment card that your opponent can potentially destroy. You have to activate for a cost, you know. Uh, it's a reasonable idea, cool theme deck, uh, with lots of interesting stylized versions of different Yu-Gi-Oh monsters, like kind of a reference to itself. I always thought it was kind of cool, but it was shocking how long it was before that got like more support, you know, like other good tune cards. Um, it was hilarious to me to see like 15 years later, uh, I I saw a YouTube video or something that was like, tune deck gets proper support, and I was like, I, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> it's been... <what? laughs> It's been like half my life. <laughs> like what? <laughs> what are you doing? What is happening over with Yu-Gi-Oh? So anyway, I uh, yes, I can relate to that as well. Even though I don't really know that much about uh, the Yu-Gi-Oh situation, we ride. Oh, sorry. Let me get rid of this. Curry Rice, you said there exists some Exodia type setups in Library of Ruina, and I, those I feel are balanced by needing a lot of mechanical knowledge to get through various types of enemy encounters. Right, like you have to know what is coming in from the enemies so that you can do your thing while avoiding like whatever stuff happens to them. Uh, yeah, I mean, to some extent, it can also create different playstyles in a satisfying way. Uh, it can put the player potentially in a situation where they feel like they. Uh, have the ability to play around whatever stuff is happening on the enemy's end uh, by using a different tactic rather than just uh, you know tactical knowledge they can they can know the fight really well rather than like having very powerful units or making a very powerful team they can make a very specific team and just know what to expect going in I'm not explaining it that well they can try to be effective in different ways. I think this can often be a little bit of a pitfall in some games. The reason is that I think a lot of the time, what ends up happening, regardless of what the intention was, is that there is a sort of lowest common denominator way to win the fights, uh, and there becomes little reason not to do that for a lot of players. Uh, thus, there it really doesn't feel like a choice. It feels like if you know that there is this easier way to do it, it's like, why would you not just do it that way? And then if the player doesn't like, you know, learning everything about the encounter to counter it, if the player doesn't like playing that way, but it, they know it is more effective to play that way, it can make the game feel, eh, not so good. Um... But there are some lighter versions, right, like that's a good example, Curry Rice, like Blade Lineage Mare Salt Skill 3. The game conditions your brain to look for favored or dominating on clashes, but for him you want to see some neutral or hopeless if possible, uh, or like look for hard clashes. Something I think Limbus Company does exceptionally well is creates these little mini gameplay flows for identities that are simple enough that you can go find them, but it adds texture to the game, you're like looking for new things as you fight. For example, I'm playing Greg, I'm looking to wait until I stack up those doubloons from enemies with bleed getting hit, and then I want to crack out his skill 3 for big damage. When I play Marisalt, I'm trying to stack up poison on my allies with his 1 and 2, and look for a very hard to win clash to slam them with his skill 3. Like, there's a very simple gameplay flow, but they each have their own little one, and it's kind of nice. And then some supportive units, like Dawn is a good example don't really have like anything you specifically need to look out for they're just asking you for a general condition to be met like she has poise and therefore she can help the other allies with their poise um i think that's something limbus company for me anyway does very very well i think that how much an individual player likes that is probably going to be down a little bit to uh like what is the right amount for them you know is that too much to keep track of not enough to be interesting to keep track of uh, for me it's just right uh, and i think it's you can see that there's a, a trick in there that it's like one thing it's usually just one thing uh, the id has like a status effect or a, a type of charge up mechanic they have and so you can think about that but mostly just when team building and then they have like one big bongo move that they do you know um, and so you can you can figure out their gameplay pattern fairly easily at a glance without it being too complicated, I think, anyway.
이거 봐. 과정은 어쨌든 나이스. 결과는 좋잖아. 그대 이 검이 필요하오. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's cool to be able to dig into the deep lore of a character and uh, kind of use them in a way that wouldn't normally be uh, part of the game for lots of other players. But at the same time, I think there's something to be said for keeping a balance. Uh, it's all too easy for it to be that if you make it so it's it's good to approach a fight a different way. Players who start playing the game thinking, oh, it's going to be all about tactics, will end up in a situation where they're actually just meant to kind of do their homework. To win, can you tell that this is the style I I don't really prefer? But obviously, it could just be for anything. Um, doesn't have to be for like studying the game's mechanics necessarily. That won't always be the problem. Miss the crit, but did we not end up selling it down after all? I think I just forgot. Ginger reminder to swipe right during the next post-boss ego gift selection screen. Yep, I finally got that thing that gives you more ego gift options that I wrongly thought just didn't work. I've just never seen the initial the additional options. Um, I will try to remember to do that. Yes. Yeah, for the um for the balance to work, like you can see, in, in this team is a good example because there aren't that many identities that have like a super involved. <laughs> thank you, Greg. Um, like big thing that they're doing, but it's important for this recipe to work well. Curry rice, I agree. To have some grounded good stuff ideas, right? Like Liu Rodian once in a while too helps keep the design space from getting used up too quickly as well. Right, it keeps the complexity modest and it helps it. It be that you can focus on a few while having identities that do good stuff and you're happy to use, but don't necessarily take that mental overhead. It's not always, uh, it would be easy to think of them as always being the weaker, like the, the double zero IDs, but Yisong is a great example. He's literally just a gigantic clash stick. Like he just clashes really good and all of his skills do nothing but poise or like a lot of damage. Um, he's incredibly simple to play. This idea is super simple to play. Uh, which is great. It balances out the bit more involved Ishmael, Sinclair, Greg, Marisol, uh, to have a couple ideas like that. You know, I think in Limbus Company it would be interesting to analyze if I, let's say, I just made like the 20 most obvious teams I could think of. One for every status type or charge mechanic thing, a variant of each of those types, because you could easily do that nowadays, and then like three or four good stuffy teams. And you could look at those teams and say, of, that's not every team ever, not even close, but like some common teams people would make. How How is the balance of IDs that have like a, a kind of gameplay loop that you do versus IDs that are doing more of a good stuff thing, like a fairly grounded ID? Um, I, off the top of my head, it seems pretty good. I'm thinking of archetypes like Charge and Rupture and sure, it feels like there's a decent balance of manual feeling stuff and things where this ID just does an ability and it's good and it's fine. Um, but that would be interesting to talk about more sometime, I think. How are we doing on health? Pretty good, actually. I've been meaning to try out Dawn's Wishing Cairn because of this passive. Uh, you get poison poise count when defeating an enemy with bleed on them which you will probably not have too much trouble doing. But I think before up type 4, this isn't an AoE, which kind of sucks. Yeah, so I'll hold off for now. Uh, yeah, I do think that's an important part of the puzzle, uh, to balance out the amount of mental overhead a little, for sure. something else I wanted to say about that, because I, I do think the subject is interesting, like balancing the amount of uh, player, I, I don't know, like stuff that you are being told to keep in mind while you play. Uh, balancing that out is important and will have a big impact on how the game feels, but I think is often hard to see. I, I don't know, I had thoughts about that beyond what we've said so far. But I do think it's something Limbus Company does quite well. Uh, it's And it's often fun when you play a team to kind of get used to the flow of each of the given units. At least I really enjoyed that. 
And again, they're often pleasantly simple, like these little packages, which I think is very fun. Keeps it feeling like a gameplay mix-up rather than like the rules are completely different. Wow, we got staggered really bad. Friggin' crabs. <laughs> Get him out of there, that's right. Uh, I guess some healing would be nice too, eh? Yeah. Yeah, it would. Jiman, you said, do you think every sinner should get IDs of every flavor? Like, should there be a Liu ID, a Burn ID for every sinner, a W Corp for every sinner, a 7 section sinner, uh, a 7 section ID for every sinner, or is it okay that not everyone has access to every standard kit? Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of them as status types, um, and I would say. I think that that is, to some extent, the way the game seems to be going or structuring itself. Uh, you know, I there's a, a big discussion to have in here about the way Limus Company intends to extend its design space. If it's not going to give you more options for each archetype, what is it going to do? You know what I mean? At the moment, Limus Company is quite heavily designed around you being making a team that is one of the archetypes, you know, poise, bleed, uh, and then to some extent it can be other stuff too, like maybe uh, Slash Damage or Pierce, maybe a Sin Resonance type, like an All Pride or an All Envy team. But at the moment the game is quite heavily structured around that concept. And what you could do is look at, well, if it stays structured around that concept, when will, there, when will that be kind of weird, you know? At the moment, you can see from this discussion about Poise IDs we had, that there are enough options, and I think this is true for most archetypes at the moment, there are enough options that you can't bring everybody you would obviously want to bring, but you can bring most of who you would obviously want to bring. There are not too many choices, and for some slots on this team, we didn't really seriously consider bringing someone else. You could, but I didn't. I, I wouldn't. Um, Whereas eventually, the game could get to the point where, let's say they do add, you know, a poise ID for every sinner. All 12 slots on your team could have a relevant poise-related passive, maybe, or a poise-related sinner on the field, a combatant. And then you, you decide. There would be kind of full, complete opportunity cost, if you know what I mean. There wouldn't be any slots where there just isn't anything for this team to gain. And nowadays, I think sometimes if you go through all the kind of type-focused teams, occasionally there will be something like, oh, the sinking team you made has a couple of slots where there's just nothing relevant. The team can't activate any passives from that center, and none of them are sinking related, like, stuff like that. Uh, but I think we're fairly close to that not being the case, to there being like a critical mass, if you want to say it that way, of... Um, opportunity cost in the game. And Jaman, I think uh, another question to add to yours is what would, what would, why, what, hmm, I don't know how to formulate this, would it be like if they just added more? You know, in some cases, we have weird situations where the ID already has two relevant IDs to an archetype. Sinclair has two poise IDs. Mm, well, I mean, one of them, but anyway. <laughs> um, Ah, there's like something there, you know. Um, so I don't know. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure what what design direction I feel like makes the most sense for Limbus Company. You know, I've said many times before, and will continue to that I. Uh, my first note for this subject is essentially always going to be like I wish they would just change what was already there. I know why they are not doing that, but I I find it frustrating that this game is going to take, like, I think a needlessly complicated path forward rather than just improving the ones we already have. Uh, but yeah, that begs the question, so how would you do it then? Um, I don't know, I mean, I guess having a lot of opportunity cost appeals to me, and if we think about it more fully, it's like, well, what if they start doing multiple poise IDs for every character? I mean, it would take a very long time for that to be complete, for there to be multiple IDs of every archetype for every sinner. Let's just count how many that would be. Let's say eight, seven or eight archetypes, 12 sinners. Okay, so that's already like almost 100. More than what we currently have. Let's say we have almost one for each archetype for each sinner. And then we, we're, at, we're getting to the point where we have two. 
So that's like a hundred units, like a hundred more pieces of content. That's a lot, but neither does that give them literally forever before they need to make different stuff. So if they weave in, let's say half more that don't do anything like that, that are a little bit more like the Captain Ishmael's of the world, where she does have, you know, like some bleed, some burn, little splashes, but really just the hook into the game's ego gift design, and she's mostly doing things that are specific effects or resonance related effects. So that would be 100, 150 or so, you know? Um, and then you have to include egos as well. So that's a, lo that's a lot of content. I mean, that might be enough that this game is not realistically gonna be like out of space, if you will, for a uh, longer, longer than it needs to avoid being out of space for, you know? Uh, I, I don't know, seems good to me. Um, so Jaman, I guess my main concern, my answer for you is my main concern would be uh, making sure that we have the design space to keep things feeling like worth including new additions. And I feel like upon analysis, we will not run out of that design space for long enough that, yeah, give me, give me more options. Uh, I feel like the main negative would just be uh, does it feel like there's just a ridiculous amount of, you know, redundancy? Every center has like four different options for poise, and you can run literally exactly the unit that you'd want to run in every case. Uh, there's some balance concerns there, but I think uh, there is enough room. I mean, we already have many centers that don't have multiple choices for... There's an animation glitch that I got distracted by um, for a given archetype, right? Like uh, for for many teams, a given center doesn't have multiple choices for their ego. You know, they're they're just there are two or one egos in that slot for that center, and only one of them or zero of them are fueled by the team, and so it's you're not really making a choice there yet. Um, And another thing that I don't like, but which we are clearly going to get, and so as part of this discussion, is the idea of, um... Uh, so, Jaman, you said, I like how Sunk Sinclair and Blade Lineage Sinclair are, like, doing different things, differentiate themselves, even though they're both poise. The thing I don't like is that they're not remotely equally powerful. Um, they're not... it's not an interesting trade-off in the sense that Blade Lineage Sinclair is hilariously less powerful than Sunk Sinclair. But he does do something different. He does work in a different way. I like that. They are almost certainly going to buff him by adding an uptie 5. They're going to add another upgrade tier to units that they will use like they used uptie 4. They buff everyone, but they just buff the units that feel underpowered much more than other units. I don't want them to do that. I want them to just balance the things as they are not make it something where there there's absolutely no point to one of the two options until you upgrade them all the way, and then it evens out. But I know that's not what's going to happen, so I feel pedantic arguing like, ah, but I wish they wouldn't do that. Uh, so, Jaman, I, I kind of hear you. Um, I think I would, I would like it m more if they would be willing to rebalance things without adding further upgrades, further complexity, and instead make the base versions of things more complete um, from the get-go. But again, uh, because that isn't going to happen, that's not the world we live in, um, I will learn to settle for where we are. Four gloom is butts for this team, I'm not doing that. How much is Wish and Cairn again? That's very payable. In fact, let's do the corroded version. So I don't know. Um, I uh, I thought that was a very interesting topic that I did not adequately summarize with some kind of label. Um, but I would love to talk about this more, the idea of uh, having f more full opportunity cost uh, team, uh, let's call it archetype in this game, opportunity. Cost. Hopefully I've adequately discussed this topic such that you know what I mean by that, but I'm not exactly sure what to call it. Uh, Curry Rice, he said, oh god, I'm imagining the UI once we have like 20 IDs per center. <laughs> That's a whole new problem. Um, yeah, I mean, to some extent, I think the they did a decent job in that the UI is already equipped to handle, like, what if we had 12 IDs for every center? Um, but having to scroll is a whole thing. I mean, letting the player search feels like it would be a solution. 
I'm not too worried personally, but I hear what you're saying. Like, it will obviously become an issue at some point. Asymptomatic, you said, my recurring pain of those rolling release live service games is having the soft guarantee of new units with no other assurances. The free shooter Udis puts Liu Udis fairly in the realm of redundant and probably not coming out anytime soon. One of the reasons I dislike the hard, kind of type or faction angle of recent sinners, putting aside any laments for a favored sinner, getting a double zero rarity ID for a given faction instead of a triple zero one. Yeah, I, I agree. There's this weird thing where, um, because you, you kind of want to know what is coming down the pipe in these types of games, uh, and yet you get the feeling the developer is going to focus on providing like an even amount of stuff for various characters. Uh, it creates this odd back and forth where you're, you're sort of thinking about what has come before when you're imagining what could come after. Um, and yeah, like it makes units feel redundant for reasons that don't have anything to do with their specific kit. Another difficulty that sometimes comes up with this subject that no one has mentioned yet, but I'm sure those people just don't want to speak up because they feel like that's it's it's not a valid concern, but it totally is, is that you might just not have all of the units. You know, I have basically everything in Limbus Company, and this is a game where you can do that without paying like a meaningful amount of money. I just buy the battle pass every month. But I have the free time to play regularly. You know, I do mirror dungeons every week. You you know. Um and that does change things slightly as well. Something that has has irked me. I bothered me more in the past than it does now. Now we try to just have an involved discussion anyway, so it's less of a big deal, but um, is that it's quite difficult to be talking on the same frame of reference as everybody else, right? Like, not everybody has started at a similar time, so they'll have a lot of IDs, but mostly the more modern ones, and it will have been very hard for them to get an ID that a lot of players who've been playing since launch, it was quite easy for them to have. Uh, N-Corp Faust comes to mind uh, in Limbus Company. But that is definitely a pitfall that these games fall into. Pitfall that these games fall into. That's vaguely ugly wording, isn't it? Uh, anyway, I, I, uh, yes, I think that's an interesting subject if I'm understanding you correctly. Ace. Jellybean, you said, I agree. I'd love to be able to swap W Dawn for another Charge Dawn that leans more into spreading charge or buffing instead of charge. Right, like for a lot of status types, to go back to that topic, there are um, like fairly obvious, readily available archetypes that you could lean into. Like the example with, oh, I didn't notice there was a so that no one will cry. Uh oh. Oh no, Ishmael, survive. Yes, good. Okay. <laughs> good, now kill him. <laughs> um. Whoops, got a little bit distracted by your lovely comment. Um, but what are you going to do? Um, this boss will just have to deal. I'll heal later, it's fine. Uh, right, like for, for many archetypes, it's easy to imagine having a variant of that, you know, of like a charge ID for Dawn that's more supportive rather than more of a burst damage option. Um, I, I do have some, uh, it's not the end of the world, but some, some concerns about whether or not those IDs will feel, uh, good to use. So for example, in Dawn's case, I would say because of the existence of her telepole ego providing really good charge support, and the fact that W Corp Dawn is very powerful, like provides some fragile, so good team support, and also really good burst damage, very good sin affinities for that team. I do have some concern that there isn't as much room for one of them to not feel clearly a little stronger. That's not the end of the world. There will be a lot of players, and I usually am this type of player, who won't care provided they're close enough. You know, as long as they're both pretty good and they have different strengths, it's just not a big deal to me which one is maybe arguably a little better. And for some players that will feel very obvious, but I think that's okay, that's not the end of the world. I think that with Blade Lineage Sinclair and Sank Sinclair, we have an example of a case where the balance is, I am going to argue, not close enough for them to feel like good options over each other. Uh, but uh, provided it's not like that, I don't know. I mean, I think in some cases it will be hard to balance that. That's basically all I was getting at. Uh, but I, I really like the idea of there being uh, variant approaches for each archetype. A system that I've been wanting to see in games like Limbus Company is, uh, okay, so I I follow Fate Grand Order, not a game I recommend or have played or will play on the stream. Uh, I don't think it is a good game overall. 
But as with many kind of questionable games that are behind the times but still like tr trying, I guess is how I feel, uh, they often have pretty interesting mechanics. You just need to put that mechanic into a game where that is better, like that is a more interesting game mechanically. Um, and one of the ones from Fake Grand Order that I I, I kind of want to just put wholesale in Limbus Company, but I would love to see in more similar games, is that your team, so for, for Limbus Company, it would be the six centers on the field. They have a cost uh, to equip, and you have a certain amount of points to fill. So for example, it might be you can have 100 points worth of team member on your combat team, and let's say a triple zero ID would cost like 20, and a double zero ID would cost like 15 or something such that you literally need to run some lower power IDs that are lower power. There's, they're not, it's not really equal with other identities. Um, they just are less powerful. But because it's a given that you need to run some lower power IDs, there's an interesting arena for design space that like the, the support of Dawn just is less powerful, but she does do something different and she does cost less, you know? Uh, uh, Jellybean, yes, like um, like they did in Mirror Dungeon 2. Mirror Dungeon 2 and Limbus Company did kind of have this mechanic, uh, where you had to pay less resources to buy in uh, lower rarity IDs. Now, I still feel like that didn't really do the same thing, in that you absolutely could run all max level IDs at a certain point. It just was harder, not impossible, but just more difficult, right? You you gave up some resources. You couldn't run all high rarity IDs at the beginning of the run, but you could continue buying just high rarity IDs. Um, there was a good benefit for lower rarity IDs, but you could always kind of play around it too. I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. I just think it's interesting to consider what it does to the game's balance if you if you say you, you cannot run a whole team of high rarity IDs. Um, I, th I think that's interesting. I think a lot of games like Limbus Company could potentially benefit from a stricter system like that. It can open up design space. It's cool to allow effects to feel good without them being the same power level as other effects. Warframe also has a really big example of this. Warframe has uh, a bunch of mod slots to make your weapons stronger, but then a dedicated utility, Exilus it's called a mod slot. Um, that can only have effects that don't explicitly increase your weapon's damage output to something it couldn't have done otherwise. It'll give you things like zoom enhancement, or uh, your bullets have less spread, so at further range you probably will do more damage, but if you'd just gotten closer you would have done the same damage. Um, these effects are good, can increase your damage when leveraged properly, but are a level of power down. Even giving a weapon absolutely flawless accuracy in Warframe simply wouldn't feel that good, competing with the damage effects that we get access to for a lot of players, so they gave them a slot where they don't have to compete with those effects. I think it's the same idea here. I think that's very valuable for these games. And you can see how it allows you to make identities that do things that are just are weak, like that thing just is a weak thing to do, but it's cool, it's fun to do some of these things, even though they're just kind of bad. Um, I, ba -ba, I'm waffling on this a lot. I'm going to take Special Contract. So I don't know. Um, that, that interests me a lot as a possibility uh, for this game. But you're right. The Mirror Dungeon 2 system is definitely similar. Uh, I just... I, w I want more. I want it to go further. Is it too late for perversion? I don't think so. I think this is still really good. Uh, also, it, it advantages Wrath skills, and uh, this team has a lot of Wrath skills, so I think that it's a little better than usual as well. Painkiller is pretty good, but I don't have that many resources. I'm gonna upgrade my Ego Gifts a lot, but I am greedy man, so let's buy it anyway. <laughs> um, Ishmael took big damage, so I'm gonna buy a heal because that's basically buying Ego resources. But I have enough that I could be topping her off myself. I, yeah, it's kind of a questionable purchase, but what are you going to do? I'm a questionable man. How about that? Asymptomatic, you said another topic related here could be community balance patches. Are a thing for certain games. Uh, the community just adjusts the game's level of balance. Live service games are all but locked into first party trust 
which I need to take at face value and move on. Sure. Um, yeah, I think a, a, a big subject here is the, the always pet topic of mine of game playtesting and how I think a lot of these uh, balance points could have been gotten more right from the start, but it would require a really comprehensive change to the way that playtesting is done in the industry. Uh, and I would like to just do it myself, uh, but what can you do? Uh, these guys are a meaningful threat, so let's pop off. That's a lot of gluttony. Let's spend it on healing instead. Let's spend it on impending day instead. <laughs> uh, and continue healing a lot. Yes. And even more. Pour it on. Uh, that's too, too gloom. I don't really want to pay that. But too bad. We're going to pour it on. Get in there. Curry Race, you say, I want to see a refraction railway that focuses on running low rarity IDs over speed. Interesting. Our boss rush mode could do something like you get a discount on how many turns you cleared the boss rush in if you run lower rarity IDs. Or you get the general rewards from using all your triple zero lineups, your high rarity ID lineups, but you get banners that scale with how many less triple zero IDs you run. Interesting. Yep, I, I could see that being a fun challenge for some people, sure. Yeah, I think there's design space to be had there. Uh, I think a good way to balance the build decisions in games is just to allow the player to win more if they make a more interesting build decision, rather than forcing them to. Like, I, I said that I kind of wanted the game to force you to use lower rarity IDs, but I'm definitely not opposed to the benefits of not forcing the player to, but rewarding them for it. Like, the way Mirror Dungeon 2 did it really was good, like, that was a reasonable approach. Um, I liked that more than I like the way Mirror Dungeon 3 has done it, but uh, if they change it every season, well, we'll see what happens next, I suppose. This is sort of not about archetype opportunity cost anymore, but I thought that was an interesting topic. <sighs> have we adequately staggered the hooligans? I don't know. We really haven't. We have not properly neutralized them, no. Ishmael, use up the rest of my gloom. Okay, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. Um, yeah, Sinclair has the passive where I get a lot of the resource type he kills an enemy with if I get a kill. I want that to generate gluttony. And so I would like, now that I have this active, to use Lantern and get a bunch of kills, get the healing that I want, but then also get a bunch of kills and generate a bunch of gluttony. But they're not they're not low enough yet. I'm gonna go regret. We're gonna we're gonna stonk up a little more is what we're gonna do. That'd be a greedy play. Thar be greed. That's right. Uh, that's that's how we do on this stream. That's correct. <laughs> the RB hubris. Yarg. Well, I, I don't think of it that way exactly. Like, I'm trying to make sure the enemies are staggered, properly neutralized, before I go for a somewhat greedy play. Yes. I might kill them too hard, actually. I think I needed to... I actually needed to hold back more, coincidentally. That's the problem. We have a lot of skills in the dashboard, so it's hard to, um, like, slightly change the amount of damage we're doing. This is actually not bad. That's not bad. Sinclair, did you go fast? Nice. Nice. Well done, my boy. Kill them. Let's, uh, hmm. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, counting the amount of absolute resonance for Ishmael's pursue them to the end. If we chain five pride, then it's guaranteed. Which we did. It's not greed, it's called maximizing profits. That's right. That's what I like to hear. This is a proper business. Pirates, please. I prefer the term privateer. It sounds more like I'm running a legitimate enterprise. Uh, please. This is a, uh, a, uh, a highly calculated transaction. 
pretty sure we will end up getting none of them, actually. Like, we, I needed to do a bunch of blocks if I want. Yeah, no, this is, they're all just gonna die. It's fine. Yeah. No. Mission failed. We'll get him next time. I mean, we won and I got the heal, but we, we didn't get any gluttony resource refund. Which is kind of a problem. Uh... But it's it's fine. It'll be fine. I'll just put just push your feelings down. You know, it's gonna be all right. This skill is so ridiculous for uh, checks. You see how much it 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 went for? We won so easily. Um, I will do the event and then sell the gift. These are the blade lineage specific gifts. Lol, or I just won't get it. Okay, <laughs> same difference, I guess. Uh, we're trying to not overly buff the team since there's those blade lineage specific gifts going on. Yeah, another topic that um that we could get into that I'm always happy to get into uh, that I love in these kinds of games. Another system from Fake Grand Order, actually. Uh, is the topic of grailing. Um, this is a system that Fake Grand Order uses which allows you to uniquely increase the level cap of some units. Uh, I guess like rebalancing units yourself um, is what it lets you do. Uh, you can commit a resource that is somewhat limited in the game to allow you to uh, increase the level cap of lower rarity units to be the level cap of higher rarity units. In Fake Grand Order, you see uh, lower rarity characters would level up to a lower max level than higher rarity characters. But you can adjust that with Grails. Now, it only gives them raw stats, but what they did that I think is kind of clever is that a lot of the low rarity units have really good utility, but they just don't have, like, enough beef or whatever. Uh, to match up, you know, maybe their damage will be incredibly negligible, which balances out their team utility. But then, if you want to, you can choose a few of those to elevate. They don't really become overpowered, in the sense that they only ever do, like, about the damage of what the higher rarity units were already doing. But it can mean that their utility has less of a raw damage output opportunity cost. Uh, you don't dominate fights with any utility you couldn't have had otherwise, but you do gain damage where you might have lacked it, and thus make a certain preferred piece of lower rarity jank feel like less like it's diluting the power of your team. And remember that this is the same game that already has the mechanic where you need to run some lower rarity identities because of that team cost limit thing we talked about in the previous topic. This combines to a very cool experience. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to create teams where you, uh, you uniquely have elevated one of the lower rarity units to be a kind of damage cog alongside others. Uh, it can be a lot of fun, and it creates a kind of a uniqueness to your account, while simultaneously, uh, simultaneously being designed in a way that kind of elegantly makes sure it is balanced as well. Like, you still have a good experience of the game's difficulty. You can't really break the game by grailing things, um, which I think is cool, in theory. Now, unfortunately, I think one of the bad pieces of news is that it does, at least doing it that way, requires a lot of design specific to that game or to some games. Like, uh, Jellybean, you said, what would that look like in Limbus Company? Just being able to add three levels to a double zero ID? You could do that. You know, in Limbus Company, levels are not used the same way, of course. And so you can't just, like, level a double zero ID up to the level of a triple zero ID. They're kind of balanced the opposite way to how Fake Grand Order does it. Uh, they have less utility, but not always particularly less stats, and they the levels are used very differently in Limbus Company. So I don't think there's an easy solution. Um, but... Again, you could make Limbus Company and just not use levels the way Limbus Company does. I would prefer that. Uh, you could just have there be a set level cap in Limbus Company. I don't think it's a good thing that the game has a variable increasing over time level cap. You could just get rid of that. <laughs> let's just get rid of it. I mean, they're not going to do this anyway, so let's speculate. Um, I throw that out. Like, throw out that piece of design. I don't think it's worth it. Um, and then double zero IDs can be lower than triple zero IDs. In fact, in Limbus Company, 
subtly increasing the your your level cap uh, to balance an ID. Like, that does affect your clashing power, but I feel like that would subtly make it a more meaningful balance knob, right? Like, let's say that triple uh, zero, the highest rarity IDs, maxed out at level, you know, 50, and double zero IDs maxed out at level 40. They would have not abysmally lower, but meaningfully lower clashing power because of how levels work in the Miss Company than uh, than triple zero IDs. And then if you, like, grailed them, if you did this mechanic from Faker and Order, it would gently adjust their clashing power, a bit more of a buff than just buffing their raw damage, but neither would it be an insanely large buff either. Um, that might be kind of nice. I think one of the criticisms I have of the grailing system in Faker and Order is that in that game, the benefit of the unit having increased stats is often a little bit too modest. Like, there just isn't enough of an increase in what the unit can do, even if you increase their level by a lot, because raw stats just don't matter that much a lot of the time. Um, so I would be pretty interested, interested indeed, to see a game that found a way to give them more of a benefit, but a systemic benefit. They still have the same effects, they just get like a, a boost in overall power that feels a bit more meaningful. Clashing power in Limbus Company might be a really good way to do that. That's interesting. Uh, li -ba -ba. These guys are not to be messed with, so let's kill them. Let's kill them with fire. Okay. Of course, this is all hand-waving the actual balance level, like in Faker and Order as in Limbus Company. It's not as if the lower rarity units actually are consistently worse than the higher level units. Uh, something that is a little confused about both games. Uh, you know, ooh, that was a big crit. Um, the, uh, the idea that you, you balance out, or there's like a cost for lower rarity units, is kind of at odds with the idea that these games are trying to make rarity like not matter too much as well. I feel like you kind of have to pick one. Uh, in Limbus Company, sometimes double zero rarity units are decisively a level down from triple zero rarity units, and sometimes they're just not. They just they're just not. And I'm you know, <laughs> at least having the level thing would make them like fairly clearly a, a rung lower in like raw damage and clashing power. You know what I mean? But even then, you could imagine a utility unit that would just be crazy. Uh, so th there are some concerns there, but I don't think it makes it a a categorically off the table idea. That doesn't make it like bad. Period. Uh, it's just a relevant concern. Yep. Again, obviously, but it's still worth mentioning. Uh, it's not as if units are universally, you know, powered exactly according to their rarity in Limbus Company or in any game like this. Um, of course they aren't, but... And I do think that would be more important were you to implement such a system. Uh, Asymptomatic, you said the dev sanction system, player intent agency, and expression of intent are the main draws of Grayling for me. I want to prop up this game piece because I like it. Uh, she Heathcliff and she Ishmael come to mind as having some curious mechanics despite being double zero rarity. Right, and those are also examples of like sometimes a riskier unit will feel disproportionately better if you increase their stats. Um, you can imagine how much she Heathcliff and she Ishmael would, would benefit from the grails, from just increased health, like for nothing else than that, um, would meaningfully change the power level of those units because they want to be below 50% health. So if that number is a higher number, that has a slightly disproportionate benefit. Like that could be pretty powerful, uh, but not too powerful. You know, it could still be a systemic thing. Um, as Asymptomatic says, I think one of the strengths of this kind of rebalancing units yourself system, this grailing idea, is that it lets the developer set a standard, players are all playing the same game with the same base balance, and yet there's a way for the player to adjust things to what feels good to them at the same time. A little bit like unlocking items or characters, but I think this is a slightly more extreme example. Um, again, it also has a lot more of an expression of intent. It feels like that character is unique to you. It goes without saying that in Fake Grand Order, people actually use their grails, like, mostly on their waifu or husbando, which, like, that's great, you know? Having the character you just like. You just think they look cool, I don't know. Um, having them kick ass just feels good, like, that's fun. It goes without saying, that's a wonderful benefit. 
Uh, and by it goes without saying, I mean, I just said it 15 times. <laughs> Did you get that, people in the back? Um, I want to kill you. Here's what we're doing. Pulling one of these. That will not kill them. I know this. And yet, my hubris, it calls to me. Take him down. Hubris blast. Don't, no, just barely don't kill him? Nice. <laughs> Unintentionally generated a good amount of gloom, too. That wasn't why I did that, but no bad thing. Um, <laughs> it's just as well. We're just gonna continue fucking with this enemy. <laughs> Kill him! Sinclair, come on! <laughs> Damn it all. Okay, no, 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 we, we, we got him this time. We, we got him on the run. Worth. Uh, because uh, we also got a lot more gluttony resources from that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not bad to stock up now and again. It's floor four, right? Like we, you know, we got to do this sometime. Anyway, the self rebalancing thing is uh, is is cool. Ooh, Curry Rice, you said, what about doing something like that chief slot thing they did in the second Walpurgis Night event, like Mirrodin and Four? They make it so you can set a double zero or a single zero ID to get extra flat stats. Yeah, they had this thing in that Walpurgis Night event where one of your units was your like squad captain and they got some other benefits and you could potentially design those, a couple of things. You could design those in such a way that they benefit weaker units more, potentially. Uh, a simple example would be Clashing Power in Limbus Company benefits a weaker unit more than a stronger unit, I would argue. Because once you're winning a clash, increasing your clash power like does nothing or like increasing your final power only increases your damage. You don't any longer need the clashing power. The idea that a lower rarity unit usually gains more, there's a better marginal benefit, relative benefit compared to what they have uh, to increasing their clashing power is good, I think. Uh, that's, that's a way Limbus Company could do it. Uh, again, if you did away with levels, that would be even easier, but I'll shut up about that now. They're not going to do that, so... Um... And also the idea that you could you could just restrict it to only be a double zero or single zero ID. You could even make it stronger if it's a single zero ID. Um, yeah, I, I'm into it. Uh, that sounds awesome to me. I love pillow fighting for calendar procs. You're talking about how I uh, how I get this passive going and then <laughs> like pillow fist enemies until I get the killing blow with them. Uh, it's just hilarious how it takes longer than like entire floors of the beer dungeon <laughs> uh, sometimes because his skill one is so weak. Like it's so bad. Ooh, this might this is shaping up to be a pretty good fight for it though. Famous last words, I know. Look at all those staggers! We're on top of the world over here! Uh, no, my hubris? No, 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 we don't quite go for it. We don't quite go for it. We, uh... We hold. We weaken him a little bit more first. That guy's dead. Okay. <laughs> we weaken him a little bit more first. Greg shoots a man right in the head. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. I think this is the right amount. Uh... Get a couple of more staggers off. Let's okay. There's that's good. Marisol, that's good. See, this is this is good. I, I I like this. Let's let's go for it. It's not gonna work. Looks to me like you're gonna win. Why are you so upset about that? He's like, no, you're gonna lose that clash. Like, am I? He's not gonna get any kills. <laughs> we keep getting that gr that visual bug too. The magenta square when he does his lantern. Game doesn't like that. We did like basically no damage. Okay. I 
Hey, Ace, you said, that is why my runs take two hours, including loading screens. I typically play Limbus on mobile, since I like the finger sliding action that the UI was almost certainly engineered for. For sure, I if I had a, I have a very cheap phone, uh, like a really cheap phone. You know, I'm sure some of you know this. You know the thing where you go to the, the phone store or whatever, and they, they're not going to tell you, at least my past phone stores that I don't go to anymore didn't, didn't tell me, they're not going to tell you that you could get a phone that will do the job for like a fifth of the cost of the one that they're going to try to sell you and have you pay off over the next like five years. Um, but you totally can. There might have been a moment where you realize like, oh, I can just buy like, they sell like third party or even first party variants of phones that I was buying that like will do all the phone stuff and are just slower as computers. Like, because I'm not buying a gaming computer, I'm buying a cell phone. <laughs> I mean, nowadays, I am <laughs> regretting that decision a little bit, um, but I, uh, and one could use their gaming computer too. Um, and so I, uh, for me, it's not a very good experience. My phone is really slow when running most of these games, uh, so I hardly ever play them on it. Uh, I sometimes do story on it. It's just cozy to hang out somewhere. And I would say that if I, like in a couple of years, when I've maybe stabilized my income a bit more, I, I am, like I, like, I like playing stuff on the couch or whatever. I probably will invest in like a gaming phone explicitly. I think that I am one of the people that is for, if you will. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, that's That's been on my mind a little bit lately. It's funny you brought that up. I, I want such a thing, but, um... What passives do we want here? Regret, I suppose. The sanity regen. Those. Yeah. Just an idle thought, since we're getting near the end of the stream. This is the floor 4 boss, and then we'll do as much of floor 5 as we have time for, and then that'll be this, we'll, we'll do a summary and that'll be the stream. I, um, while Ishmael is good and all here, I think you can see how the team does struggle with the gloom quite a bit, and Greg g certainly gives you some, it's, it helps, uh, but it, it would be nice if it wasn't competing with as much. Like, I really am interested in adding Udis, I think there's something there. Um, and uh, we talked about this before, but she would give you a lot more gloom, and then would it be as big of a deal? Anyway, um... But, uh... Yeah. Anyway, just that's on my mind, since we're gonna have to wrap up within, like, the next half hour, 45 minutes, maybe? Told my partner to come in and interrupt when she wants pizza. Nice, yeah, 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 yeah. But I don't want you to do that attack. So no, this is a good yield my flesh situation, but not not against this. <laughs> Hit me with something else. Yeah, 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 like that. That's perfect. Um, okay, I want to get rid of that. Okay, we got this taken care of. That's a great clash for that. Yep, good job, Greg. Uh, we've got three. Yeah, we gotta deal with this. Okay. Um, Sinclair? No? How about yes, though? <laughs> what, if, what if you just do win the, win the clash? Put the camera back. There we go. Yeah. My clash numbers are doing something weird. I don't know what's going on with that. Great. That's pretty risky. Let's not, let's not just go. Will this be Daijobu? Uh, don't worry. All going according to Keikaku. We're gonna be fine. Watch this. Trust <laughs> is my highly analytical response in this three hour long involved discussion stream. <laughs> what is my logic for these clashes? Trust. 
Ace, you said, I'm biased as someone with a career in computers about the phone thing. I'm occasionally asked for recommendations for computers or phones or laptops. Swinging upwards, like $800 plus, can hurt, but like a modern smartphone is statistically within the arm's reach for the modern consumer, uh, the common consumer. I agree. Um, yeah, I mean, like, you can pay it off. Like, that works for a lot of people. Um, I just think the savings are rather substantial if you like won't say like it was definitely worth me saving i saved about 800 dollars over the phone i would have bought uh, by it's funny you mentioned that amount of money um by buying this phone and that it has i mean i've noticed that it's slower than like my partner's phone or like friends of mine's phones but it was absolutely worth like you paid me 800 dollars to have like a little lag like for me it was a very good choice but i think that has a lot to do with me uh, doing video stuff for a living as well. Like, I'm, I'm there's a lot of other reasons why I kind of want to be at my gaming PC um, that might not apply to as many other people. I think that that's factored in too. Like a lot of things, I think the best thing to do is just like spend a little while thinking about it. You know, for most people, spending a few weeks keeping in mind, you know, look for times when you would want to have, you know, the good gaming computer phone <laughs> um and then if that comes up enough then go for it but i think for a lot of people they would they would find that it doesn't asymptomatic you said the most common complaint i hear is someone working off a 200 dollar chromebook or whatever got what they paid for it's interesting you mention that because i have a 200 hundred dollar chromebook that i bought 15 years ago and it's still going uh, that's what I'll watch, like, anime or something on if I just want to hang out in, you know, my tea cave or on the couch or whatever and I want a smaller screen. Or, like, I'll bring it on trips because it's it's cheap and paradoxically has meant it's, like, completely unproblematic when I'm on trips. <laughs> it's never had any problems or gotten lost or stolen. I one time was in the kitchen with, you know, like a hard floor and I... I guess my hands got tired or something, and I basically straight up threw it at the ground, and it's completely unharmed. I mean, I'm six feet tall, I like, m might as well have whipped it at the ground. Accidentally. Uh, totally unharmed. Like, not an ad. Uh, it's not. I don't think you should buy a $200 Chromebook nowadays, but certainly at the time I got one, it, it I mean, it's been pretty indestructible. Like, the, th the thing has been the most valuable player as far as items that I own. Really wish this screen of like showing you which skill was getting clashed with what was better. The less you care about something, the more durable it is. That's right. Because I don't care at all if it survives, it's made of adamantium and cannot be slain by mortal weapons. That's right. Um, Asymptomatic, right, wisely points out 15 years ago is also right around that sweet spot where big tech still made quality products without cutting too many corners. Right, it's also, I mean, this is like an Asus Chromebook. Like, it's a nice manufacturer. Um, it's it, That matters as well. I'm not an expert in such things, but that's certainly been my experience. Again, I'm not sponsored by or currently recommending Asus. Uh, Asus? Asus? Um, I just, that had been my experience at the time, certainly. And right, the environmental factors, uh, like the, the timing does check out, as Asymptomatic put it. Give me a heal. Big clash money. Anywho, I just thought that was interesting. Curry Rice, you said, my college Dell laptop went flying off the counter when I tripped over the charging cord and somehow survived the trip across the room. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's crazy. The, but there, Asymptomatic says, there are so many geopolitical topics when it comes to technology now. I let my eyes and ears glaze over? Is there a collective term for that? My whole being just kind of... You know, <laughs> washes through the environment <laughs> yes i uh I, I i cannot be bothered perhaps i might say uh most of the time but it's a subject i'm interested in i'm aware there are factors that might affect me and if i need to make a big decision i'll often dive in a little bit and then take a shower afterward um... yeah, yeah, yeah 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 get him uh anywho 
Curry Race, you said, also completely new topic. What are your thoughts on Wa Egos now being part of the extraction pool from next week? Yes, Gregor is getting a tier 4 ego. Um, I mean, I, I'm glad they're adding more. I, I want more egos to come out because at the moment that's a part of the game that doesn't have much opportunity cost. Like a lot of the time there are no choices for a given ego, for a given character, for a given team. Uh, so I want, I want that to change. Um, that's sort of a creatory answer, you know? It's like, that's what I would say. Uh, ah, yes, a very uh, Zandy thing to say. Um, but that that is how I feel. Um, something is like wigging out with my clashes here and it's really frustrating. We're getting paralyzed from this, so I'm trying to be greedy. Greed, go. Yeah, so as Asymptomatic says, most of my response is, I'm relieved that it's going to be more often that we get higher tier egos than once per season. Um, though it was bound to change at some point, given the sample size of two, right? <laughs> it might not mean much. We might still be getting them about once per season. Um... It's possible it was meant for next season. We did get delayed. That's a good point, Jellybean. Um, but I, I don't know. I reckon they're they're gonna speed it up a bit. Um, if you think about how long it would take for us to get a reasonable amount at the pace we were going, uh, that hurts. Um, I don't know. I, I it makes sense that it would speed up. I don't see it as particularly noteworthy. I guess I see it as like that's of course what was gonna happen. Um, I don't mean to shut down discussion about it. I just personally it didn't it didn't register much for me. I saw it as like, well, they've got to, you know, they got to pick up the pace somewhere, <laughs> um, was how it felt to me. This fight's become a real slugfest, but we're doing pretty good so far. Uh, sustained. One one thing that's good about these slugfest fights for teams like this is you can see the teams sustain. You know, like, how does the poise go? If a unit's poise count gets really high, does do they suddenly have trouble maintaining it? Um, it looks like mostly, no, we're in a pretty good place. Some graphical... Oh god. <laughs> Some gra <laughs> Dear lord. <laughs> Some graphical... Uh, mm, aside. Um... You can see that uh, most of the unit's poise count is pretty good. Um, we can see a couple examples like Sinclair, where because his skill 3 spends it, it's not super high, but he still has some. Units like Greg that went to the moon because of the Ego Gift uh, we have, that's giving him a ton of Gloom uh, affinity, uh, poise, potency, and count gain. Um, we have Yasang, who I would expect to maintain his, his poise, and he mostly has. Again, Dawn, it's like, he, they have a modest amount, it's fine. Dawn is doing good, she's fine. Uh, Mersault is a little low, but he got stunned. Yeah, it's it's fine. Um, I, I just thought that was worth looking at since we're here. Or am I just gonna... Are we just gonna go in? I'm pretty sure we're just... I'm just gonna get in there. Let's just kill him. Gotta go full ham. Perhaps it was too early to go full ham. You might be, you might be thinking, but uh... I think we'll be fine. We'll see. Rip. That's a dead Ishmael, baby. Uh, and we're gonna leave her dead because then we can try using Udas. <laughs> uh, it's fine. 
Should I not have gone for the throat as soon? Uh, you tell me. Yes. <laughs> Correct. This part of this fight always takes forever. And, uh, ah, oh, my eyes. No. Why? Why are you like this? I'm not going to learn from my mistakes. <laughs> just, just, just kill him. I'm done. Take me home. Okay. The Sinclair loss is actually bad. Uh, the Ishmael death cry was long. Yeah, that was that was some text. Uh, nice. But this is fine. Uh, I wanted to see uh, Sank Udis on the team as well. So let's do that. This perfect opportunity for that. Uh, for the end of the stream. And I, I just got tired of playing tennis and decided to go ham. Uh, went perfectly fine, I think. All planned. Uh, this is ridiculously good. And the other things aren't. And these are all, like, sort of equal. I mean, I, I love this, but... Level plus six. Oh, defense level plus six. That's fine. <laughs> uh, homeward. Yep. Pretty good. And thus it was that a new age began for the uh, for our our humble little run today. Ooh, blood, sweat, and tears. Nice. Yeah. Ooh, this skill replacement. Well. Uh, I actually don't know this ID well enough, and I actually don't have that much... that many resources. Her skill 3 is Gloom. Well, that decides that. <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. Um, let's also buy the heal. That also gets Udis's, um... Oh, I should have checked to sell. Um... Nice. <laughs> no, Delavine, it's fine. I wouldn't have remembered. It's not a big deal. Her skill 3 being Lust is also relevant to the team, so it's fine. Not a big deal. Yeah, I know you didn't do that on purpose. It's okay. Uh, it doesn't make a huge difference. It's 2 versus 1. And having the um, more Lust output is good for the Egos I had on her. I didn't really look at Egos enough here. Uh, something to do when we get out of here. This is going to be rough. Uh, but yeah, let's make a note for... Uh... Who does he goes for this theme? Definitely worth a look. Hey, Udis, I heard you like dodge. Let's uh, give it a go, shall we? Make my day. He'll be fine. That probably won't be that fine. This music is awesome, as usual, uh, but we're gonna get... We're gonna get wrecked. Let's see what we can do. Oof. These guys are chonks. But that's a good testing ground. Oh right, I forgot, um... I didn't level Udis at all. Uh, yeah, so this isn't gonna be meaningful. <laughs> um, but we, we can at least see, uh, how her poise generation stacks up. She's not at uptight 4, but that mostly stays similar. Uh, if she doesn't die, we can at least see what her poise is like. But yeah, she's not leveled. It's not gonna be relevant damage or clashing power anything, basically. <laughs> uh, because I didn't intend to test her during this, but what are you gonna do? She can dodge at least, yep. Um, it, one of Udis's, uh quirks is that she she's sort of designed to be like a dodge tank. Um, she can go fast, uh, bind the enemy or get haste, uh, and then dodge them with a high value and get poise from doing so. Uh, pretty interesting. If you evade a lot of coins, it can be a lot. 
Slash, we might just be dead here. <laughs> uh, as, as often happens late in the run. But that's okay. I mean, that's why it's nice to get to the end. So we get to see a nice power gradient of when the team is having trouble, but like still okay-ish, and then when it's uh, really out of hand. Fighting the Blade Lineage guys is obviously a bit more, you know, this is a modest challenge. But we'll see. I kind of like to see the team fall apart. I've grown fond of having the runs sort of collapse on floor 5 rather than sweating hard to maybe kill the boss when it often takes way more time than I have to stream. We're already over by like 15 minutes or so uh, than my planned time, but it's not the end of the world. Was good damage. Nice. Largely recovered. This is fine. Look at this. Oh, come on, Sinclair. You had that one in the bag. Ugh. Terrible. Oh, he's dead. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and again, Udis was always... I, that, that was a mistake. I didn't realize she was uh, totally unleveled. I forgot. Rip. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I think so. Uh, give me the, uh... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Kill him. Yeah, get him! They thought they hot, but they not. Get him out of there. Get him out of there. Again! Again! I had you fooled, didn't I, chat? Nah, bones, bones acquired, calcium obtained. <laughs> nice. <Ooh. laughs> Welcome to the back streets. Oh, baby. Get him. Kill him. Wait, why is it friendly firing so much? I, I targeted the one that wasn't friendly. Oh, no, we killed, the we killed the enemies it was going to hit, so it friendly fired us more. <laughs> Did Udis die from doing that? What happened? Who died? No! <laughs> okay, yeah, we're probably we're probably screwed now. Um, well, I mean, are we though? Because we have um I mean <laughs> that's a nice pride chain. Would you like some offense level with your offense level? Uh well, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Marisol can probably kill most of this encounter by himself now, so we'll see. Calcium obtained, lol. <laughs> hey, Symptomatic, thank you for the stream. Witty retort in closing comment. Uh, of course. <laughs> Appropriate response. Something about looking forward to future videos. Yeah, it's been going okay. I've been having trouble maintaining the pace alongside some health problems and maintaining the stream and parlay and stuff. Like, it's still been very hard to get it all up at once. But we have been getting pretty close, which helps me feel a little bit more encouraged, at least. Um, we're close to, um, Udis is gonna die, so I'm actually just gonna dodge for those, grab an AoE, um, we're close to having relatively consistent, uh, about weekly videos, which is not bad, I'm, I'm doing neither, neither great nor poorly on my goal to get to that point, is how I currently feel, uh, but we're, we're getting close, we're almost there. Uh, and I'm pretty happy with the streams. Um, so I'm I'm I haven't put a video on the Bootleg Big Builds channel about this yet, but I probably will have by the time this is an archive there. So for the live audience, um, what I'm trying to do with that channel is be less picky about every single thing that goes up being this like perfectly polished and intended thing, and instead saying, look, what's the what do you think was the best thing from you know this week? Put that up as a stream archive. And if people hate them, then I can always stop doing that. I think a lot of weeks, like more weeks than not, it will be a build brewery, the, the build lab, the build brewery, um, these. 
and some weeks it won't, and I think that's fine. I'm gonna try putting those up for a little bit, and I think for me, the value is being consistent, just for the sake of being consistent. Uh, I think will make me a better creator, and I've already neglected that long enough. Time to learn from my mistake and just try to be consistent for the sake of consistency for a little bit. Uh, so that's why I'm doing that. But I do, I wouldn't do it if I, I, if it was literally just for me and I thought it would be like not fun or good for the audience. Uh, I hope it will be more consistent, interesting entertainment. If you follow the Bootleg Builds channel like for a certain kind of thing, you will reliably get that thing from following that channel. Uh, as opposed to before when you, like, really, really didn't. Uh, hey, Faust, sure. Probably want to put her forth. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try that for a little bit. And we are getting closer to a drink-related project as well. So i got to figure out where, how I'm going to balance putting that places. We need healing. I need healing. Oh, it's enough mana. I'm out of mana. My mana is low. No? Anyone? Uh, that's bad. This doesn't look terrible. Maybe we'll be fine. We're probably gonna die here. Asymptomatic, you said for uploads, there's still the overnight upload bottleneck, right? Being selective is no dire fault in my from my kneeling chair. Um, yeah, so my I'll talk about that for a second. Sure, my current upload situation is that a lot of parts of the world, the download speed is really fast, uh, but the upload speed is still really bad, and that's the internet where I live. I live in a, in a nice area, but the, the upload speed is still not very good. And YouTube's upload speed is actually kind of a bigger problem as well. Um, when I upload, I upload my videos to Patreon as well as YouTube, so that there's a version that you can watch without needing to do any ad blocking, or if YouTube doesn't let you watch it if you have an ad blocker, you, who cares about that? You could just go in the description and click on the link that gives you a freely accessible to everyone version that will not have any ads. Uh, I think that's very important nowadays, so I do it for every video. And I can do that because Patreon's uploader is, for whatever reason, just way better than YouTube's uploader. <laughs> um, it takes way less time, for whatever reason, uh, for that to go up. And a little enough time that it has essentially no impact on my work. Um, I wouldn't be able to do that if it took just as long as uploading the video normally. When I make Parlay for the Pantaloon Saloon channel and mainline videos for the Zany Pants channel, I upload them, I make them, and then I upload them overnight using my other computer. So that computer stays on, but it's not in my, you know, sleeping room, uh, so it doesn't keep me awake. And uh, then I, you know, do the thumbnail and tags and the description and etc. cetera, and uh, all, is, all is well. So at the moment, that does make it a little bit more difficult to easily, we're gonna die, but that's okay. Um, this crack battle is going terribly, indeed. Uh, we lost more salt, so that's it's all over with the crime. That's okay. Um, so at the moment, it's it. I wouldn't be able to add a lot more videos made that way. But the thing about stream archives is that Twitch does this nice thing where they will Twitch will send the video to YouTube for you. You don't have to download the video from Twitch and then upload it yourself to YouTube. Twitch will send it to you, basically upload it to YouTube for you. Uh, you you know it'll it'll be spending time busy on their servers instead of your internet connection. Uh, this is huge. It means that sending a stream archive to YouTube has essentially no cost. I just have to wait for it to get there. Um, that's huge. If that wasn't the case, I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, so it's not a concern at the moment. Um, adding the bootleg builds stream archives isn't isn't a huge deal. Asymptomatic. It's also true that the um, uploading them like sending a parlay video or like a main zany pants video sending both of those to uh my youtube accounts from my computer it doesn't have a huge cost in the sense that uh, like it, the computer is gonna be occupied all night and it's gonna finish in time and so it doesn't make a huge difference if i put in like two versus three parlay for example uh, it's not the end of the world and of course i'm not on my computers all day during the workday. I, I am on it most of the day, but if I take a shower, watch a movie, go grocery shopping, whatever, I can upload a, uh, like a Zandy Pants channel video, and if that video is like 10 to 20 minutes, it takes about an hour and a half for it to upload to YouTube, 
that's enough that it's no interruption. So as long as I plan around it, it's like fine. Um, I, I wouldn't worry about the video thing. It's nice of you to say that. It's thoughtful of you to say, well, look, it's not super easy for you to upload a bunch of stuff. But actually for the stream archives, it's mostly fine. Sweet. Actually still pretty good for a first messy attempt. Give me the money. And uh, let's debrief, shall we? Squaffed. And take a look. Pretty interested in the Udis ID. Uh, let's... Let's break down what we got. Shall we? Again, a rhetorical question. We're going to do it, even if you say no. I... <laughs> um... I, I liked the version of the team we ran. Um, I think that the pursue them to the end consistency is really good. So uh, Captain Ishmael is really good on this team. Blind Obsession wanting a lot of gloom, and then you don't generate a lot of gloom unless you run Udis. But then if you run Udis over Captain Ishmael, you don't need a lot of gloom, but you generate it. It is kind of a hmm thing. Uh, Mersault, Chains of Others does take one Gloom, but it's not a huge deal. Pursuance takes one. Um, I, I want the Gloom, even if Ishmael isn't here, but it's not the end of the world. So I, I liked this theme. I, I do have a couple of thoughts. One of them is that I wasn't that impressed by Dawn in this case. I think it's the lack of the guarantee that she's going to provide double benefit from her two passives. Uh, and the, the thing is that Ishmael kind of eats that. Like, if you take Ishmael off the team, then Dawn gets a lot stronger. So I'm kind of interested in doing something like this, where though you have reduced the number of Blade Lineage units a lot, and then maybe you'd consider adding back in Faust or something, uh, you have created a situation where you can use... It's a very good Ishmael team, basically, and then you also have like the very best Blade Lineage units. But it's very easy to get three Blade Lineage units buffed, so you would get a very nice benefit if you added just one more, Faust or Dawn. And now the team generates a lot of Lust. Like, well, not a lot of Lust, but a decent amount. You get some from there, and you get some from Sinclair. And very few things on this team use it, so if you added Faust back in, now the team could probably adequately fuel, fuel Fluid Sack. That is pretty interesting to me. I'm not really sure... Like, you could cut Greg, I guess. He was pretty good. Um, His damage is always very good. You know, he's just a raw damage beat stick. Uh, he has good, you know, fine sin affinities for this team. His egos kind of suck for this team. Uh, his, I mean, they suck in general unless they're for basically just rupture teams. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's a thing. I would like to try this. I'm, I'm kind of interested in that. But then there's a beautiful opportunity cost thing, right? Like, now that you're back to three Blade Lineage units, uh, Dawn looks kind of good, but you still have Ishmael. So I don't know. I um, There are a lot of ways I think would be cool to build this team. I think I want to try something like this next. I was pretty happy with Sank Sinclair's damage output. Um, I didn't... I don't know, in a way he's weird because he doesn't have a lot of synergy with the team, but he's so good and then the team will have poise ego gifts for mirror dungeons. His ego quality is really good, we got to see a good amount of that. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm into trying more Udis on the team. Uh, I would be interested in these, like a squad like this. A, a side note, looking at this version of the team, is that the Wrath generation of the team has quietly become pretty bad. Um, along the way of the many changes that we've done. Now, you can generate a lot with Sinclair, potentially, uh, but you would need to. Um, and this team can benefit from using quite a bit. Uh, you regret, would love it if you generated a lot of Wrath. So that's something to think about, maybe. I don't know. Um, I mentioned a note at the beginning of the stream that I, I'm the kind of player where I want variance in units. And so because I'm happy using Captain Ishmael, on a team where I think she is even better than she is fantastic on this theme, which is this team, uh, a, an NB resonance focused team that can also do pride very easily. Um, she is incredible on this team. The other two Pequod units are really good. Uh, she's a slam dunk 
hit on this theme. Because of that, I am less excited to build an, like another team where she's also really good. So you could look at it that way. Um, what if we do that? So we assume no Ishmael, just like for just because, just because you want variety. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think running Don or Greg, and they're both like good poise units. This is good support. You now four blade lineage units. Um, it looks good. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, one thing we talked about with Don is that um, the Sank units have this thing where they generate a lot of poise count, but they don't generate much potency. And so her skill two will inject them with poise potency. You could consider that good. And then her skill three will actually probably hit blade lineage units because the poise count of the Sank units is so high. So that's kind of good. That's that's cute. I don't know. Do I want that over Greg? I don't know. That's hard. That's hard. You get a little more uh, gloom from Greg, but now the team doesn't have as much of a problem with that. But you get good gluttony egos from Greg. Ah. Dawn's support passive for this theme is pretty good. It is. One ally with the least poise gets more poise potency when gaining poise potency. Two times max per turn, I assume. Um, this is a good passive, yep. Um, it's it's good for the Sank units as well. Yep. Um, so you could say that gives Greg the win. Yep. I'm into it. Uh, I, I, I think that's a, a good way to go. It's kind of a shame. Again, I, I, I like Dawn as a unit. Uh, I, there's, I'm just trying to find a good fit. Anyway, uh, so I don't know. I mean, I thought, I thought Ishmael was very good on this theme, but if you wanted to make something different, uh, I think more gloom generation does make sense. And if you were to do that, one of the other things you could use it for if you didn't want to go for a blind obsession Captain Ishmael uh, is Faust. You could suddenly fluid sack quite a bit. And this team's uh, gluttony generation was also like, okay. Uh, so you could use uh, representation emitter is now suddenly pretty good. You have massive pride, so that's easy. And then it costs a little gluttony, but you have it. So that's cool. Uh, I, I'm very sold on uh, Mersault and Yasang, and I, I really liked Sank Sinclair on this theme. I, I thought he felt good, uh, and the, the gluttony added a lot. The team has pretty good heals. Uh, yeah, it was fun. There's a, a lot of different options that I think make good sense. Dawn might slightly take the edge here, because leaving her, uh, well, lose the edge, I guess. Take the edge as a support passive, because this is a very nice support passive, where a lot of these other ones you don't gain as much by leaving them off the team. Whereas Dawn is one of the ones where if you don't put her on the field, you get something nice in return. Faust was like that too. This is a good support passive. But yeah, uh, lots of lots of options. Uh, I suppose we could try to retool it in a way where you only avoid using units I'm using on that other team, but I think that might be bending over a little more backwards than most people would. Is that true, chat? Uh, bending over backwards a little more than most people would to avoid repeating units on teams. I also bet a lot of people are not using Blade Lineage Faust on this team, uh, but I think I am going to. Hey, Syntomatic, you said, I personally like having Grip Sinclair as my sole gloom unit, so pendants every turn poise candy goes to him. Ooh, cool. Yep. Uh, that's another thing you could do. Have only one unit that doesn't generate poise, and have it be a unit with gloom skills. So when you get the pendant ego gift, they get a ton of gloom uh, poise. And the negative coinage is somewhat more explosive with crits, since it goes high to low rather than the traditional flow of low to high. Interesting. Yeah, the one who shall grip Sinclair on this theme is pretty spicy. That's cool. Uh, I could get into that. It would help the team's lust and gloom generation a lot as well. That sounds kind of cool. I am down to try that. Let's look at that. Uh, so we'll put him there, and do this. Uh, well, no, they're not the only. Th we have to get other gloom units off, so you can't run Faust or Greg. You could still run Ishmael if you wanted to. You could st you can't run Udis because she's got gloom. Yeah, that is that's restrictive. Having it be only, having it be only him that has a gloom skill is restrictive. But if you look at it like this, you only need one more unit, uh, so it's it's not the end of the world either. Cool. Anyone else? Is there? Who else even has poise? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, Harpooner Heathcliff does generate poise, so you could do that. 
Anyway, well, it's more than we have time for, but I think that's an interesting idea. I would absolutely be willing to give this a try. Um, right now, we can't unpack that entire thing, but that's a very cool idea. Um, since you will get that pendant pretty consistently and it'll shore up his poise. Um, cool. Um, Curry Rice said, I don't have too much time to talk about this today, but you said if you tried the base Ishmael comp that runs Blind Obsession, uh, yeah, the idea of this, if people aren't familiar, is that base Ishmael has very high speed and does fuel uh, some of the needs for Blind Obsession. Uh, this is an okay skill. Um, and so you can run her as a, a delivery piece for Blind Obsession. Uh, the idea here is that she uh, applies big damage boosts to the team, but they're the same turn. So if she goes first, then it's more beneficial. Uh, I have, I'm familiar with that tactic. Uh, you could use that here, sure. Um, this is a really good Captain Ishmael team for what it's worth. Uh, she's also pretty fast, but uh, it doesn't mean you have to do that. Cool. Tori, you caught us right at the end of the stream, but it was fun. Um, I hope I I got people good ideas for different Blade Lineage units. It, I, have a, I have a kind of creator problem at the end of these streams a lot of the time where I, I my, my instinct is to show you my kind of final answer when the goal of the stream is to demonstrate that there if you if you see the full context there is no final answer like you could make a decision that you like better but it is clearly very sensible to make plenty different decisions as well like that's kind of the only value to discussing it at this point to prevent there from feeling like there's one final answer like hopefully to your delight and then you feel like there are lots of options and you pick the one you like i guess it's because it makes me feel like i'm not picking the one i like but i like a lot of them um i don't know i mean my my preference is in fact to like largely avoid repeating units um, so I am pretty interested in the idea of making a team that is like avoiding Captain Ishmael and maybe Faust here and maximizing Dawn, even though I'm I kind of question how strong she is in this case. And I liked Sung Sinclair on this theme. I, that that really appealed to me. Another interesting thing is that on on this theme previously, we had kind of that pendant trick where the Pendant Ego Gift will give a Gloom ally tons of poise, which means they will not be targeted by Dawn's skill 2 and 3. The other units will get poise, and thus it will be Blade Lineage units, and thus they'll get more poise, and that's good. Um, Greg is a great fit for that, if he's your only Gloom unit. Uh, so you could do that, but then if you run Udis or Faust, that doesn't that doesn't work, and then that basically by process of elimination, you're running Ishmael, Ah, like, <laughs> that's a sort of deadlock. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm really leaning toward putting Faust back in because more Blade Lineage allies would give the team various benefits. Uh, Faust on the team also means you can use the Gloom that you now have a little bit more of to use Fluid Zack, which would be nice. Again, I think Representation Emitter is a like reasonable ego on this team too. So yeah, I don't know. Um, this is, I, I love this part of making builds, and so for me, this is the good place to end it. Asymptomatic, you said the hoop jumping is real and I'm here for it. I'm glad. Uh, that's largely what I want out of these discussions as well. Once you've gotten to this point in the discussion, to me it's like we've essentially finished talking about it. Uh, we have a, a large area of opportunity cost on the table, and to me the ideal discussion would be that I leave feeling like there are more good options than when I started. Like, I thought there were various different units to choose from, but leaving, I'm I'm more indecisive than I started decisive. I, you, you know, um, to me, that's kind of good. Uh, hopefully, if you were looking for a recommendation, this is well and truly enough recommendations. Uh, I, I guess I would say in a vacuum, I liked this version of the team, and it, it makes a lot of sense. There are a lot of benefits, uh, but at the same time, I probably won't use Ishmael here, though. And I am interested in this Udis unit. I was It always appealed to me that she's kind of a dodge tank. I think that's quite good. The dodges will avoid um, 
like damage certain kinds of offense level buffs. I forget exactly which ones, but dodges often uh, survive clashes that would have been very hard to win. So an aggro unit that uses dodge is quite strong, and her sin affinities are pretty sweet for this theme. So I'm into it. Uh, that interests me. And you could cut Greg and do this, I guess, and have uh, you're avoiding Greg's kind of questionable egos for the team. You get the Faust uh, with actual proper gloom and lust generation to fuel fluid sack. Like this is a good fluid sack team now. If you want that, some people might say they hate that. They're sick of that. I could see that, but it, it is good. Um, you can probably use some of Udis's egos kind of okay. We said we were going to talk about that, but I'm not really sure what to say. Um, they're kind of janky because a lot of them want lust. Uh, maybe Sun Shower is sort of okay? Eh, kind of? Nah, 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 it's okay. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think uh, Sank Udis is an interesting one here. I'm inclined to try this version of the team. I feel bad because I like Pirate Greg, but his egos are definitely the weak link here, though Ledgermain wasn't terrible because of Sank Sinclair's gluttony generation. Uh, and he, he is just raw damage, like he is just a beat stick. Um, I think I think I'm interested in this version. Uh, you get to run kind of the best of the the blade lineage IDs, and you get a very very nice set of kind of companion, still very poise focused IDs that have interesting like weird positive synergy with the way that Dawn works, because uh, they'll have a lot of poise count, and therefore the poise count buff will hit your blade lineage units, and you'll get more of it. Uh, I think four, like, slightly erring on the side of more Blade Lineage units is also good because Marisol can easily give out four units worth of buffs. His passive wants you to chain three Pride, so three Blade Lineage units is sort of like the, around the amount I'm looking for, but you can easily do four, so I, I don't think that's bad. Um, but that would be a piece of guidance. Like, there's lots of good poise units to add, but I would try to start with Marisalt plus two other Blade Lineage allies, probably Dawn and Yisang, uh, and then choose the other ones you like. Again, the, the way these Sunk IDs generally work is they stack a lot of poise count, and thus Dawn will not give them poise count, but she probably will give them poise potency, and I don't think that's the end of the world. It's kind of beneficial on them. Um, it, to go back again, since J Jellybean mentioned it, um, the way Dawn's is worded is one ally with no poise or the least poise potency in this case, give them two poise potency. If they're from the blade lineage, you give them twice the benefit. And then her skill three is the same, but with count. Ally, two allies with no poise or the least poise count, give them two poise count. If they're from blade lineage, give them twice as much. So this will almost certainly hit Blade Lineage allies, because the Sank IDs specialize in poise count so much. And this will almost certainly hit a Sank ID, but that's kind of good. Like, the, you, everybody gets more of what they were lacking. Uh, in theory, I think that's nice, like a happy accident. Yes, shoring up the weak spots of both, right. Um, so that that's cool, that appeals to me. Uh, it's poetic, which is a bias I have. That's so, oh, it's so clean, it's so, ooh, crispy. Um, I, I tend to like that kind of thing, but anyway, um, I I am interested in this approach, but uh, I feel bad leaving Greg here. Like, this is a good idea, and I know I was trying to avoid doing too much overlap with this theme, but I think it's worth noting, if you were interested in, like, bleed with poise and red plum blossom synergy, I do think there is a great team that revolves around that, and I would say it is this theme, uh, give or take a few units you could swap in um you could put pirate greg on this theme as well um but he doesn't do like too much bleed he wants the enemies to have bleed but he's really doing more poise i think can you get this team to be dawn doesn't mention poise right we'd give her some but uh yeah that's interesting because some some ego gifts and for for various mechanics using ego resources uh, and strategies from Ego Gifts in Mirror Dungeons, is sometimes you want every single unit to have, you know, Poise or Bleed or whatever in their kit. And I was just looking at, does do both teams, like, does this team mention Poise and Bleed on every unit? Pretty close, uh, but I don't think, I don't know if Ishmael counts for Poise, she does mention it, but I'm not sure if that's in a way that counts. And then you'd have to swap out Mersault for Greg, and then Dawn doesn't mention Poise. So, so close, but... 
Anyway, something you could play around with if you're interested. Okay, that's well and truly enough. Uh, great stream, folks. Well done. Folks, if you enjoyed this, I'd love to have you back. We do this this time every week. Uh, we start like a few hours ago if you were around then. And if you have anything left that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to, please leave it in this form, in the Archive Parlay form. I'll answer it around this time next week as part of the break segment. You can especially help me by doing that, not just because it gives me something to discuss during the break segments, that's nice and all. I could come up with something if I needed to. Uh, but also because I don't want to miss people's thoughts. Like, I, I often feel a bit stressed out ending the stream because there was so much good stuff to talk about and I don't want to lose it. That's one of the reasons I stream. It's valuable. You get good ideas you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. You can help me feel less like I'm losing something honestly precious to me. I know that sounds kind of ridiculous, but that's how I feel uh, by putting it in that form. If you really have something you wanted to share, please go ahead and put it in there. That's why it's there. I'd love to have you. Uh, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.